is it? All right, let's get back to some boring subjects. Understand the risk to our country. Freedom brings people together. You're listening to the We Are Libertarians Network. Learn more at wearelibertarians.com. All right, welcome to We Are Libertarians. My name is Chris Spangle, and in this episode, I am joined with Sarah Brady Wagner, and we are going to cover the Democrats, all the Democrats running for president, and we're going to try and do it in 90 minutes. And we know most of you are probably never going to vote for these people, but we want you to not sound dumb when you're talking to your friends. And frankly, I don't know much about them, so we're going we're gonna to go through and, and give you a little bit about each candidate in a speed round, basically. So stay tuned. Information coming your way. Warning. This show is for adults, produced by semi-adults. So the language is sometimes strong and offensive. Uh, I don't know what I said. Uh. Welcome to We Are Libertarians, where our goal is to help you sound smarter while talking to your friends. We examine current events from a libertarian perspective while treating modern politics with all of the irreverence it deserves. There has been lie after lie. We toss out the screaming heads with people before political parties and give context to the news to make you think. Now, here's our host, a 15-year veteran of politics and media, Chris Spangle. All right, welcome to this episode of We Are Libertarians. Again, my name is Chris Spangle, and, and I'm gonna I'm gonna fade this down because we've got one audio channel coming from the computer, and uh, so on Zoom is my good friend Sarah Brady Wagner, live from North Carolina. Sarah, how are you? I am doing great. Oh, I need to turn you up. I'm sorry. Oh, oh, am I doing great now? I don't yeah, know. It depends great. on what my volume is. Yes, and Harry is not here. Harry did not quit. I have to give you that preamble every time. Uh, a network was down and he couldn't, he just couldn't be here, which actually worked out better because, uh, Sarah, we have 28 pages of notes on Democrats. So we're going to do a marathon. Yes. All and right. It's a sprint. I have to thank Hody Johns and Sam Schultz, our research team. They did an amazing job on this. And even down to the wire, I was at the pool today uh, because it was the first day the pool was open and I went there and yes, I am absolutely fried under the shirt. I am lobster red and I was swimming and, and uh, went to go to read the notes poolside and I was like, well, I better go back early because I need to organize these notes and put them in the order we're going to read them in. And Hody had already done it. And so I got an extra hour which really, Sarah, Hody's responsible for my sunburn. I think he owes me a public uh, an apology, right? Oh, right. Yes, he's not responsible for any of that rest or relaxation. None of that. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, but a special thank you to Hody. I really do appreciate Hody and Sam and all the work that they do. So if you don't catch all of this show and, and you're just like, man, I just want an overview of the Democrats and, and, and you don't totally listen to this show, which honestly you should listen to every minute, but if you don't, there's a great outline that you can go and just kind of skim through. And we're going to try and do this in 90 minutes, Sarah. We've got, I didn't even count. How many, did you count how many are in here? I mean, there's, I, th I think we're up to 22 total candidates. So, but I mean, some of them are, are more worth covering than others. Yes. So we're not going to belabor this. Let's just get right into it. Um, usually we chit chat at the beginning, but I feel like, Sarah, we've got to get right to it. Okay. So old white guy, number one. All right. Now there's now listen, you'll be happy. There's a lot of intersectionality. And the reason Sarah is here is that uh, you had to fill your diversity quota. No, you understand the language of the left. And so you're the closest thing to a Democrat that I know of. Uh, you, that's, that's, I'm, I'm going to take that as a compliment, I think. <laughs> well, you understand when they're when they're when they're talking about things you under, like it's almost like at, at this point we're we're in two different cultures and you understand the language of the left. You're not a Democrat. You are a card-carrying Libertarian Party member, um, but you you definitely understand their lingo. Is that fair to say? Oh yes, yes. I speak I speak the language of the left. Yes, and so I don't. And so Sarah is happy to translate. She's my translator. <laughs> so she's my progressive translator. Um, uh, but yeah, so let's start with Joe Biden. Uh, I'll give you, so we basically asked the fellas to put together uh, just some details, some biographical details and some policy points and nothing super in-depth. And then Sarah and I are just going to give you some color commentary on these 
candidates, and we're going to do it in the order of how they're polling. We're going to let you know what you can tell your friends who are really excited about them, what's objectionable. (laughs) Right, exactly. And a lot of just data in this episode, less opinion than normal, just a lot of facts. Because like I said in the intro, I don't expect, I mean, Sarah, I don't know how many, what happens in, in your circles. I mean, on social media, we're all kind of in our own little echo chambers. I don't know a lot of people that are going to vote for many of these people. Tulsi Gabbard's probably the one that when we talk about her, we'll talk about the libertarian love affair with her. But I don't, I don't see a lot of libertarians voting for any of these people. So we're just trying to give you some facts. See, these are the moments where I'm like, all right, yeah, I do have more left friends than most libertarians I know. Because I do know some people who will be voting on this. In fact, I, I tried to gather opinions beforehand. So. All right, good. She's the color commentator, and I'm play-by-play on this. So tell us about Biden. I, right. As I like to say, he's old white guy number one. All right. So Joe Biden, uh, is he was the 47th vice president of the United States. We all know Joe Biden at this point. I think most listeners kind of know his face at least. They know uh, creepy Uncle Joe. Creepy Uncle Joe, yes. Mostly, he's that guy from memes. Uh, first, the Biden memes where he was doing dumb things with Barack Obama, and now the ones where he's touching people. Sniffing hair. Right. And he was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom by Barack Obama for his service as vice president in 2017. Now, he was a senator from Delaware in 1973 to 2009 when he became vice president. Now, Biden is the very definition of a career politician. He was elected to the Senate in 73. He was the sixth youngest senator ever elected. And when he left the role, he was the fourth oldest vice president. Uh, the fourth oldest senator. So he was the sixth youngest to the fourth oldest United States senator. Now, he was, he was very handsome, Sarah. Have you seen young Joe Biden? I, I have not. You might hear, quick, send me a picture please, and please we have Google, an instant reaction here. Please I can Google, Google it. Yeah, Google it. And then I'm going to give the next point and then we'll hear your reaction. Okay. Live. Young Joe, oh my. Yes, right? I'm sorry. Uh, he is surprisingly attractive. Foxy. One might say. Um, yeah, very- as I, there's immediately one that says, I would text a young Joe Biden at 1.27 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> so Joe, Joe is very handsome, very charismatic, and, and still is. I would say he's a handsome, charismatic man. Um, now, he was a product of tragedy right after his election, and his wife and one-year-old daughter were killed in a car accident, and his two sons survived the accident. Um, Now, he considered resigning to deal with the grief, but he was persuaded by Senate Majority Leader Mike Mansfield not to do so. Now, he refers to the event as a hazard of drunk driving, but the police released a statement that all parties were checked and nobody was drinking. The driver that hit his family, furthermore, was cleared of all wrongdoing after a lengthy trial, where it was determined that he had obeyed all laws and the incident was nothing more than a mistake by Nelia, Biden's wife in thinking she had enough time to get through the intersection before the truck arrived. And this is sort of the beginning of a lot of Biden white lies. There's a lot that if you, the more that Joe Biden, the more that you start to hear about them, the more that he pops up in the press, he, t- he just says a lot of things that aren't true. And he, he thinks he can get away with it. And then when you fact check him, uh, for instance, in 2008, Eight, when he was running for vice president or when he was running for president in that cycle, you know, he said, hey, listen, I talk to the regular people every single day. I go to this one diner in my hometown. Go talk to the go talk to the people. Tell them they'll tell you exactly what I hear every day. And the diner had been closed for like 10 years. Uh, you know, it's just like these little things that Biden just sort of says that aren't true. And he's either knowingly lying or just sort of Sloppy casually, and casually fabricating things. Right. Yeah. I mean, and who amongst us, Sarah, has not said things that we're like, this might be true. I'm just going to wing it. Uh, but none of us are vice president or running for president. So it, it has it carries a little more weight when you're running for the nuclear codes. Yeah. So well, go ahead, Sarah. No, I was to say, so does does he have much more of a history beyond that? Yes, and so, which we will hear, especially the plagiarism, which ended his one presidential campaign. Um, So he was remarried five years after the accident to Jill, who we know as Jill Biden, who we have seen on the campaign trail. 
Uh, so there were problems at Syracuse Law College. He was caught plagiarizing five of his 15 pages reviewing an article. And ordinarily, plagiarizing is an immediate disqualifier from the bar, but he protested and was granted leniency because he claimed he didn't know he had to issue citation for that type of article. And in 1987, well after he had graduated, journalists found that he had plagiarized almost everything he submitted during his time at the school. In a confession, Biden admitted what he had done, but said it wasn't malevolent. So due to the length of time that had passed, this discovery was ineligible as evidence before the bar, and he was able to keep his license. But it did end up becoming uh, the thing that killed his, uh, his race for president in 88. Uh, and it... I don't know. Plagiarism back then probably seemed like a big deal. It feels like we're so far down the rabbit hole that yeah. like, all he did was plagiarize, elect the man. Do we believe in intellectual property? Exactly. I, when I first learned about this in 2008, I was like, who cares about plagiarism? So uh, I'm sure the person being ripped off does, but I mean, uh, in terms of a politician lying, I'm not surprised. So, yeah. But still, I mean, pretty much everything. That's, that's an impressive level of, of- casual uh, I, w- I mean that's just intense. i think that's the thing that really just kind of like stands out of, of all this is it's not he's right it's not malevolent it's casual and in a lot of ways that's a little worse because you can never then have like there's no integrity there you don't know when something is being you know exaggerated just for the sake of narrative or just to be impressive yeah well he seems like the type of frat bro in college that bought the paper off of the nerd Mm-hmm. And then the, the nerd just gave everybody the same paper. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, the, the, I'm sure that's just a movie uh, that that comes from and not real mm-hmm. life. But um, I'm doing my best Joe Biden here, apparently. Uh, so, yeah, he, he is fast and loose with the truth. And that is something that has always sunk his presidential runs uh, along with his just his his friendliness, let's say, you know, uh, not only just touching people and invading their personal space, as we've seen in the memes, but also in 2007 or eight, he said, you know, Barack Obama, hey, who wouldn't want, who wouldn't love to have him as a nominee? He's a young, clean black man. And, Ugh. you know, it, and it just was, it ended it because it was like, you can't say that. Yeah, that's a little cringy. Right. And obviously they got along really well. And Joe Biden doesn't strike me as a racist in any way, shape or form. You know, he's just kind of almost 80. And Mm -hmm. there's there's just certain things that you do when you're of that generation, I guess. But obviously he clearly in my mind, I don't know the guy's heart, but he doesn't seem racist to me. But he just was trying to say, look how good he is and used phraseology. That's that's not. Yeah, he's he's just not quite in step with the current. Duh. with the current Harlem. lingo <laughs> which is which is really one of the biggest criticisms from the left and when you have such a large field of intersectional players meaning that's you know, why he's he's either creepy uncle joe or old white guy right which i mean the the thing that i've heard that is only like the really good positive it's he is people think that he can beat trump and that's concerning it, because that's the only positive here's the funny thing is everybody said so many great things about joe biden in 2016 2015, 2016. Nobody has any now. Nobody has any now. It's, it's just amazing how quickly, like, meme culture really dominates. Because here's a guy who was just beloved at the end of the pres- at Barack's presidency. And now he's just like, if you support him, there's, it's almost like supporting Hillary Clinton. Yeah. Well, I mean, but he comes from that same, that, that kind of old guard. It's just even in a lot of ways for some people it's okay well hillary clinton was maybe just a step too far we just need to take a step back from hillary clinton it's like within the democratic party i understand there are plenty of people like that interestingly the the uh consensus seems to be that they don't tend to come out to rallies so he has really poor turnout to uh his actual like rallies but um they are people who have influence they're donors they're the people who you know have been in the democratic party for a while but they're not in line with the more progressive wing of the party well and here's the funny thing about biden's backing is he is old guard but he he is backed by a lot of the machinery of obama which in 2007 2008 was replacing the old guard of the clinton machine and so you you have this this weird 
you don't have it as much in the Republican Party. It is that way right now because Trump has fragmented the conservative movements and Republican wings so in so many different ways. And they've almost become like Democrats. Uh, with the Democratic Party, you, you, it's made up of a lot of different coalitions, whereas the Republican Party was more ideological, ideologically centered uh, and top-down from the Republican Party. But the Democratic Party, so there was, there's always been a, an, an ability to kind of wrestle for control. And for the longest time, the Clintons controlled it. I mean, Terry mm -hmm. McCall. McAuliffe. Uh, I always accidentally call him Terry McAwful, which is what Rush Limbaugh calls him. <laughs> hey, 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 he gave me my voting rights back. <laughs> Very good. And so Terry McAuliffe and, um, you know, a lot of the, the Clinton machine ran the Democratic Party from 92 on. And then Barack Obama came in and wrested control for a brief period, but didn't really put the stake through the heart of the Clinton machine. And then you know, that caused him a lot of issues by bringing her into the administration. And now you have sort of a splinter of the people running the party and that 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 lack of centralization on on the Democratic side is really kind of causing a lot of problems. But Biden, the reason he's so um, well regarded is that he can kind of walk between those two groups that control the Democratic Party. And He's asked Barack Obama not to endorse him, but obviously he was his vice president and a lot of those people like Joe and are probably going to work for him. And that was a formidable machine. I mean, there was the, the Barack Obama campaigns, especially of 2008, were spectacular. And so Biden, I think, is a formidable person as long as he doesn't gaff himself out of this, which is totally possible. And as Trump has called him, 1% Joe because of his failed bids for president and 88 in 2008 where he failed to get 2% of the vote for his nomination. And that's because of his own mouth. And he's really kind of a great support, but he's not a great leader. So, Sarah, I don't, I don't know how well he'll actually do. Well, what's his scorecard then? Well, how does, how, what are the kind of policies that he actually presents that right. you can kind of respond to? So let's jump into it. Very good segue. It was very, uh, I'm ruining this. I just want to compliment Sarah because that was such an amazing segue. You're uh, ruining it. I'm ruining the segue, but <laughs> I'm so impressed because I've never had a co-host do that before. It's literally in 350 some odd episodes. I'm so happy right now. <laughs> um, so on Joe Biden's issues, war is, uh, he, he votes left. I mean, he's, he's a uh, down the middle old school Democrat. And war is sometimes an exception where he votes with the left. Uh, he vocally supported Obama's foreign interventions and a senator led the charge for American troops in the Bosnian conflict in both 94 and 95. And he pushed for intervention in Iraq. He opposed the Gulf War and changed course on Iraq in 2007, where he voted against sending additional troops. Um, and he's one of the few. So on issues of foreign policy, as many people are pointing out, he's been wrong on every single thing in terms of foreign policy uh, since his be the beginning of his career. And right now, for, there's a lot of big foreign policy challenges. And do you want somebody like Joe Biden in charge? But Donald Trump's in charge. So <laughs> there's really, better. I, I would say in foreign policy versus Donald Trump, Donald Trump's better than Joe Biden. I agree with Donald Trump more than I agree with those policy points that, that we just heard from Joe yeah. Biden. You know, at least with Trump, if something starts to escalate with Iran, he does have a non-interventionist streak. Would you agree with that? I, I would, okay, I would agree with you that he has a non-interventionist streak, but I would say that he has a troubling amount of interventionists who he surrounds himself with Absolutely. who tend to have a quick turnaround on their impact. Like, I mean, how quickly did he, did he, you know, come back from, okay, we're pulling out our troops. It's like, well, maybe not. No, Sorry, I talked to some of my friends. Yeah. No, it's, it's very true. I mean, he, he, we have ended up with the Bush regime in charge at, in the foreign policy departments. Uh, he at least has that streak. But yeah, I mean, that's one of the disappointing things about Donald Trump is that he has not followed through on that non-interventionist and, and when it comes to North Korea, it looks like he's getting completely played at this point, which we all kind of knew would happen. But 
he at least had the cojones to do something completely different than what the foreign council on foreign relations wanted. And it was worth a shot. I mean, what's the worst that could happen? Kim Jong-un does exactly whatever he wants, which is what he would have done regardless. So, uh, so I've been disappointed on by Trump on the foreign policy side because of exactly what you pointed out. He's just brought in a bunch of, you know, interventionist people and Joe Biden would do exactly the same thing. Um, you know, he's neocons, uh, right? He surrounded himself with neocons. Absolutely. Uh, so he's one of the few politicians who supported the stimulus for both Bush and Obama. Uh, he's a Keynesian. Right. <laughs> at, at least he was consistently for ruining the economy. Um, during Obama's three consecutive emergency spending bills from, uh, from 10 to 12, it was Biden who was tasked with getting Republicans to vote for each to pass, which he successfully negotiated each time. Uh, granted Republicans, uh, he granted Republicans additional spending on their projects. Now, Biden was the leading voice in passing the Violent Crime and Control and Law Enforcement Act, which, helped, which he helped author, which is the crime bill uh, from the Clinton era. And this is highly controversial in the Democratic Party. Uh, and he is, so Sarah, correct me if I'm wrong, but like to, to Democrats, the crime bill is sort of like Mike Pence authored the Patriot Act. So yeah. it's like, that triggers libertarians. So like Mike Pence will never get a lot of libertarian votes because he authored the Patriot Act. And so because he authored the crime bill, a lot of people on the left just will absolutely not support him for a lot of mm -hmm. the reasons that will we'll explain. You know, we may not, we may not like to acknowledge it, but there is actually like a civil libertarian uh, wing of the Democrat party when they're the yeah. ones who are really push, you know, CJR and they're, you know, also tend to be non-interventionist. It's, yeah. they come but, out every once in a while. Like the Intercept, I think is a great. I think mm -hmm. the Intercept, Democracy Now, those are left-leaning sites that I read regularly, because I, like, I get along with a lot of their points of view, and I, I see a lot of their arguments when it comes to foreign policy and and criminal justice reform and things like that. So I think there is that wing in the left that we can kind of uh, collaborate with, but Joe Biden is not part of that. Right. Yeah. I mean, the the big thing that. Um Aside from it increasing just overall prison population, the big thing that sticks with the crime bill is uh, the death penalty part. Is it, in, it said you can use the death penalty for more. Right. Um, you know, and if, if you're ideologically opposed to the death penalty in general or, you know, believe very strongly in the power of redemption, then that, that can be a really big problem. And that's, that's something you see with a lot of Democrats. I mean, right. it's common so here's a few here's a few facts so it's at 356 pages it is the largest crime bill in the history of the united states and it instituted many of the policies that shape law enforcement today from police officers to prisons to sentencing it banned assault weapons it expanded the use of the death penalty it created new classes of individuals who were not allowed to possess firearms it made harsher punishments for illegal immigrants who possessed firearms or had drugs on them it established the now infamous hate crime laws, as well as additional penalties for crimes involving sex and gangs. It established federal sanctions against states and counties who did not enforce these laws or have enough names in their sex offender registry by September of 97, which led to a slew of, quote, sex crimes like public urination and consensual sex amongst teens because police departments and the district attorney's offices were under pressure to populate this list. It ill it illegalized grants and funding, both private and public, that would give inmates access to higher education while incarcerated. Um, and not to mention, it, it's not necessarily the federal government's role to get involved in many of this. But, you know, you have to think about the time. We're coming off of things like the L.A. riots, the, the Rodney King beating, the, who's the truck driver, Denny, uh, who was beaten, um, a lot of major crimes, a, a huge crime wave in the late 80s, early 90s. And there was a lot of pressure on Clinton to solve these problems. You know, you're, you're the president, you need to fix crime. That, so it was a huge discussion through the 90s. And some on the right will say that the crime bill is what, you know, why are you criticizing the crime bill? It led to the decrease in, uh, in crime across the nation. Um, yeah, you could also make a great argument that it led to a really huge increase in recidivism. I mean, that I don't know if you 
the, the highlight of the last thing there is a really key one. They have, we have this idea that people in jail, in prison can, you know, make themselves better with education. That hasn't been legal since the 90s. Right. Exactly right. And so what you led, it led to an explosion in the popula in the prison population. And really, is, was, was, did this make three, three strikes and you're out? That's not nationwide, is it, because of the crime bill? So uh, it's, it's federally. Um, you can still you can still have a federal three strikes rule, um, but yeah, different states also have them as well. But it was this whole like wave of you know tough on crime. You want to in a lot of ways it was these people are complete lost causes. You just need to lock them up and throw away the key. And you, you know when you walk in with that mindset, you end up with a lot of people in jail, yeah. a lot of people in prison. Uh, so I remember being in elementary school and thinking this was a great law this is exactly what clinton ought to be doing we need to lock these people up three strikes and you're out seems like a, a logical conclusion and then i grew up and it's just sad to see a lot of people still have the same thinking that i had when i was in elementary school about <laughs> criminal justice reform and it seems like our former vice president is one of those people yeah it is interesting to think of the p positions that you held surprisingly strongly as a child who hadn't uh, had an opportunity to think these through. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I, I learn every day. I mean, I, I'm like, I'm watching like abortion, for instance, not, we're not going to get into an abortion debate right now, but I will say like abortion was one of those topics that was forbidden to be talked mm -hmm. about on talk radio because it, it produced such an emotional argument. But we're now at a point in 2019 where everything is, is, is at that abortion debate level. And so it's just open season on it. But I never, ever, I have no arguments. For, mm -hmm. you know, like, I'm just soaking it all in right now. You know, and, and it's just like, I'm learning stuff every day. And it's just, I don't, I look at people sometimes, Sarah, and I go, how are you so sure? I mean, you said something in yeah. our group chat once that I was just like, man, I identify with that where you're just like, some days I'm an anarchist and some days I'm a minarchist and some days I have no idea what I am. And I'm like, I, I am so with you. I like to say, if you're, if you're not confused, then you're probably not thinking and that's more concerning than anything. Right, exactly. So not to get off on tangents because I have to stay disciplined. You're very disciplined, I'm not. So let me get back to the notes. Uh, so Biden also drafted the Violence Against Women Act and uh, noting his, oh, oh, I almost jumped to Bernie Sanders. Um, I'm, I'm lost. Hold on. Excuse me. Violence Against Women Act. Act uh, ended up being Page passed. Four. Yes, thank you. Ended up being <laughs> passed as part of the Violent Crime Control and Law Enforcement Act, but it was originally its own legislation. It was folded into that crime bill, and it, struck down, it was struck down by the Supreme Court in a 5-4 to four ruling that Congress did not have the power under the Commerce Clause to force counties to spend money in this way. And the finished bill did not change. Rather, the Violent Crime Control and Law Enforcement Act did not make it to the Supreme Court to be challenged. Um, but the crime bill required mandatory funding from all districts towards investigating and prosecuting crimes against women. It imposed automatic and mandatory restitution on the offenders who commit such crimes towards the women they violated and allows civil redress for women whose prosecutors don't press charges due to lack of evidence or faulty cases. Um, now, the final point for Biden is creepy Joe Biden and the memes and posing in pictures with the women and children were, were released. Like, here's the thing about this, like, just blowing up. I mean, we all saw this when it was, it, it's like, if you read the conservative press, that was just everywhere. Like, when he was swearing people in, every time it was just a lot of pictures. I don't get the sense that... And I wonder what your opinion is, Sarah, but I don't get the sense that he is, he's inappropriate because he is violating someone's personal space. No, I, and he's, he's touching people, but I don't get sexual predator from Joe Biden. I just get inappropriate old man vibes off of him, like George H.W. Bush. Yeah, there's, um, you can, one of the, he actually made comment about, you know, his, reputation and his memes I, I really want to know who had that conversation with him like hey What's joe that? you know you know you're in memes now <laughs> you might want to make a comment <laughs> um but he, he he made a comment about how he's basically he's a touchy-feely person which gets gradually creepier as particularly men get older and you know we get to a point where then it's like 
y- you, they're old enough that you assume a sort of senility and then it becomes like, oh, well, that's just that charming old man. But it certainly doesn't seem to be, a, like you said, it's not malevolent. Um, but it does, like we were saying before, it kind of reflects a, a being out of step with the current expectations of his environment in the party. Right. Uh, that's not, it's not socially acceptable to be an old guy in a powerful position who's a touchy-feely guy anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, as a touchy-feely person myself, I, I feel for him. Sometimes you have to remind yourself it's not okay to touch people. Yeah, I, I am with the people that I know really well, but like I have a real big personal space with strangers. And like I, if I, I don't want, like I've had politicians come up and do that thing or you have that like coworker who walks up and rubs your shoulders and you're just like, stop get away from me and so you know he's i i feel that it is a lot of a a lot of the the creepy joe biden stuff is a convenient way to diminish his uh, his chances in in an environment that eats that up and the memes are easy Mm -hmm. But, but i don't feel that it's totally fair there's so many with so many of these things it's like it's so easy to go after Joe Biden on the creepy Joe Biden stuff, but it's hard to explain why the crime bill is wrong. Yeah. Well, because one's a lot more granular than the other. It's, right. it's easy to make jokes. Right. Exactly. Which we all love. So that is Joe Biden. You, uh, you feel free to figure out if you want to vote for Joe Biden after that. Uh, like I said, we're, we're getting very high level stuff here. We're just trying to get you some information on why, why you should or should not vote for Joe Biden. So let's move on to Bernie Sanders and uh, Sarah's old white guy. Number two. Yep. Old white guy. Number two leading in the polls. Um, Yes. Not that there's anything wrong with being an old white guy, Sarah. There's many, many. No. Okay. So here, here's my translator duty. All right, the please. reason I make that joke is because it's a joke that, that is really made among a lot of Democrats is that there's, of the candidates, it's old white guy one and two, because the idea is you have the younger, more, as you'd say, the more you know, diverse, intersectional, more progressive wing of the party. They really would like to see somebody who's not an old white guy, but you have these moderate Democrats, the more old guard, who their focus at this point seems to be what we don't want to lose to Trump. And so there's kind of an internal debate going on between, well, is the only way that you can guarantee winning against Trump to make sure that you run an old white guy? Well, so here's the thing. I think watching Democrats and Republicans the last four years, especially, I see so many of the same sort of motions that we have in the libertarian movement. So with libertarians, there's so many people who've never been experienced and had any experience in politics. They've never run. They've never worked on a campaign. They just sort of believe in the philosophy, and so they want to get involved in the party. And so for a decade, I've just watched people who don't understand how politics works get mad at things, not realizing how politics works, not realizing that like what you do for a living, you go out and teach people how to do politics. And I think it's hard to say to some of these progressive activists, some of these younger people who are frustrated with the way things are, it's not an acceptable answer to them maybe to say like, well, these guys have been around for a long time and they've run for president a few times. And so they have networks and they have experience. And so it just sort of gets you to that level a lot quicker. And that's why they're at that level. And if you just keep working in a couple cycles, you'll be there too. Mm-hmm. And in our nature of saying, just be patient, you'll get there. Does That doesn't work, especially with the younger. I don't the, want to be patient. Less, yeah. The younger the person, the less patient they are. So Bernie Sanders, uh, being old white guy, but he is self-described as a socialist and a progressive, which again, this is kind of one of those translation things that within the whole self-described concept, people who self-describe as socialists and progressives, in my experience, have an objection to Bernie Sanders self-describing right. as, yeah, which it, to me kind of strikes me as like, you're never a libertarian enough for a libertarian. Right. No true Scotsman. It's sort of like, yeah. right. I'm sure knowing, having watched Matt Cano, how do I say Matt Cano's name? Kunal. Kunal. Having watched him, there, yeah, like there's no true Scotsman. And that's why everybody's terrified of the Lib Sox taking over. The libertarian mm-hmm. socialists are infiltrating the libertarian movement. It's like, watch them online. The 13th yeah. them can't get along. You think we're divisive, wait until they get into a room with each other. They can't agree on anything. Mm-hmm. The Audacious Caucus is not terrifying. They don't know what they're doing. So I would imagine that's true. Bernie Sanders, it, it is amazing how Bernie Sanders was an absolute pariah for a long time. He was the fringes, and then he was the fringy candidate in 2016, and now everybody's trying to kind of move to his position. 
I mean, again, what a difference four years, three years makes and how quickly mm-hmm. things move. Um, former mayor of Burlington, Sarah, um, I'll let you, I'm not going to read. You go ahead. <laughs> You're just stepping all over my part here, man. I'm sorry, man. <laughs> so, yes, as as Chris has already mentioned, he's a uh, former mayor of Burlington, also uh, the representative from Vermont. Uh, he is independent, but he caucuses with the Democrats. And when he wants to run as a Democrat, he becomes a Democrat. Uh, he first got involved as a political activist at when he was at the University of Chicago, when he was studying political science. Uh, and... <laughs> Noting his own Jewish heritage, Sanders says a guy named Adolf Hitler won an election in 1932. He won an election and 50 million people died as a result of that election in World War II, including 6 million Jews. So what I learned as a little kid is that politics is, in fact, very important. No floor play with Bernie Sanders. He just gets right to it. He does. He does. <laughs> so He's very libertarian in the way that he approaches things. Yeah. So uh, early member of the Young People's Socialist League. Also um, in the Congress on Racial Equality Corps and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC. Now, during his 2016 campaign, and this is, this is the number one thing that I've heard come up as to why you wouldn't vote for Sanders, is because there were issues of rape and sexual assault from his campaign staff in 2016 that he never actually addressed or apologized for. Um, and when he didn't address or apologize the incidents, it was assumed he wasn't running again. But in early 2019, he finally apologized for never having taken action, um, which is an interesting kind of roundabout way to do that. And, and it's not one. Like, here's the thing that I was amazed when I found, like, because I heard about this, but I didn't really look into it. Oh, it was a lot. When I was like, eh, I'll never vote for Bernie Sanders. I don't care. Let them eat their own. Uh, yeah. Read the next point, Sarah. <laughs> it, um. It was widely believed that he would declare soon afterwards there were hundreds of sexual conduct complaints from his office. Hundreds. Um, that he never even investigated. And, and, well, and that's, again, that's the roundabout thing. Is it, he never apologized or addressed the actual allegations. It was, oh, I'm sorry, I never addressed the allegations. I think that's probably his Achilles heel, like Biden mm-hmm. lying and his gaffes. Bernie Sanders never seems to take any responsibility for things. He never, he always kind of, he walks around things or he there never seems to be that he's just not a good leader it doesn't seem like I mean, no that, there when he doesn't know how to address things he tends to try and just sweep it under the rug and go okay well that's in the past we're not going to do that again don't worry yeah and that's to me like if i had one i would you know somebody in we are libertarian said like this happened i would go well, we got to get the, to the bottom of this like presidential campaigns are not that big you know, like the, if if you have hundreds of complaints, that's that's predatory. Somebody, several people. I mean, that, I don't know. That's really disturbing. So, as far as his voting record, he consistently votes left. Like he is so left that he's too left for the to for the Democrats. Uh, he's always on list for like top ten most partisan voters. But he did support manufacturers being held liable for crimes committed with their guns, uh, and. Bans on assault rifles and mandatory minimums of 10 years for crimes committed while in possession of a gun. Uh, he opposed the Brady Bill, which mandated federal background checks when buying a gun. It is the thing that I am trying my best to overcome in Google is the Brady Bill. Well, what do you mean? Well, my name is Sarah Brady Wagner. Oh, okay. I got you. Trying to drown it out. We're doing our best. We're going to overcome it with libertarianism. Yes, we're going to the Sarah Brady Wagner Bill. And- yes. <laughs> The gun, hands, guns in the hands of toddlers. That's <laughs> go, big go home. Oh, only, only if you are teaching good muzzle uh, discipline. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God, the Danes are going to kill me. Anyways. Um, <laughs> I was joking. Sarah does not want to arm infants. No, so. I don't. No, no. Babes in arms, not armed babies. Right. Uh, he voted against unemployment extensions when Bush was in the White House. And to his credit, he co-sponsored a balanced budget amendment with, with Rand Paul. His contribution was adding an alteration so that Social Security and Medicare would still be fully funded. Okay. Uh, he also became nationally recognized on December 10th, 2010, when he issued a rebuttal against the Tax Relief, Unemployment, and Insurance Reauthorization and Job Creation Act of 2010. He said, enough is enough. How many homes can you own? And a Republican retorted, you'd know the answer to that way better than any of us. Because he currently owns three. Uh, he is actually in the 1% now because of book sales. 
But the uh, idea being that he also, you know, it's the idea, well, I know how to spend your money better than you do. Exactly right. Yeah. Bernie Sanders is probably the premier central planner of the group. Uh, he also, there's a video of him in the Soviet Union that I saw, and there's a lot of anti-American activism in his past that, that would be very problematic because from a strategic standpoint, you think that Trump's not going to use that footage of him in the United, in, in Russia going, he hates America. He loves communism. Look at him supporting Castro. Like not even Castro, like he loves Stalin, you know, like, it, it, so mm -hmm. he, I don't think has the, uh, I, I don't think he has the ability to withstand a lot of what, when you're facing an opponent that just has no, like, let me put it in terms of Games of Thrones. The reason that the, the Night King and the White Walkers were so dangerous is that they were already dead. They had no fear. They had no, there was nothing that would stop them, no conscience that would stop them. That's Donald Trump. And so w in terms of campaigning, there are no rules for this guy. And so he's not going to play by the same rules. And Bernie Sanders, in my mind, has the most problematic track record. He's the most beloved on the left, but... If you really go back and look at 2018, the lessons of 2016 and the lessons of 2018. The lessons of 2016 were stop condescending to us. There's a lot of us out in the middle of America that are hurting. Pay attention. And I can tell you, I went to a, a festival here in Indiana recently. And my God, you have no idea how in just eat Northeast Indiana, in these towns. I mean, it was poverty that I was shocked to see. And it's not like just kind of like the homeless guy on the street and it's a one-off. Like it was institutional rural poverty mm -hmm. that I guess I just had not been exposed to since I was a kid and had kind of forgotten about, to be quite honest. It was, it was really something that moved me in a big way. And they, those people are not going to, they may want the free stuff from Bernie, but he's not going to connect to them and, and they're patriotic people. So they're not going to connect to Bernie. And then the second, the lesson of 2018 was moderate Democrats move to the center. It's, it's become a center left nation from a center right nation, but we're not down that. We're not far that far down the rabbit hole. Like you're going too far, Bernie. And so mm -hmm. I think Bernie would be the most suicidal of the choices, but somehow Democrats will find a way to mess this up. So my take on Bernie is first, if, if libertarians want to understand Bernie's relationship to the Democratic Party, think of him as he is the Ron Paul of the left. Yes. Uh, he has a lot of he has a lot of big ideas. But if you notice, we don't have a whole lot of like specific policy proposals that he champions because he is very much on. He's more of a populist than he really is, you know, a socialist or a, a anything like that. He's he is just he's appealing to what he thinks appeals to people. He just really wants to give people what they want. Um, but with that is, you know, something I'm surprised we didn't have included in our notes is his, his takes on immigration are pretty problematic. Mm. And well, um, so he's, he's very much a like closed word. Like he would build a wall if he didn't think it sounded bad. Really? Oh, oh yes. He, he is very much like wants to reduce the number of, the idea is he's one of those, well, it's best for them to stay in their own countries where they can help to, um, you know, better their own people and that we need to take care of our own people. Uh, but part of, you know, it, it's, it is something that he doesn't necessarily use as like the highlight of his campaign, but he champions that really substantial uh, welfare state socialism. And with that comes kind of an antagonism towards immigration. Right. Well, I mean, you look at what's going on in Europe, you have, poverty in, in East Berlin, for instance, I've used this example because it's a good example. In East Berlin, it's less wealthy than West Berlin because they were under communism for 50 years. And so they, they're fighting for the scraps of bureaucracy that, you know, strained resources will leave. And then all of a sudden you have African and Middle Eastern immigrants coming in. And so the Germans, the native born Germans are going, not only do I have a not, I don't have enough from this European socialist welfare state. I don't have to compete with people that I don't understand what they're saying. They don't understand my culture. They, they don't dress like me. They don't look like me. And, and so it, it has created a tremendous amount of tension there. 
And so it doesn't surprise me that um, he is very much a European socialist when it comes to immigration. We want to we want to limit this. Uh, Bernie, I would also say, is fairly decent on foreign policy and and domestic spying. Um, he can be an ally with libertarians on that stuff, but I mean, his economics are just so bad. There's it's sort of a preview of Tulsi Gabbard. I mean, yeah, there's some good things here, but by and large, he he wants a large welfare state. He does, and and with that, it's like he he has he has voted against um, supporting. A- uh, like guest worker programs. So the, he, he views them as that guest workers are a form of legalized slavery. He's actually made a right. few comments about that in the past. All right, let's move on to Elizabeth Warren. The this, other socialist. She is uh, another socialist. She is the senator from Massachusetts. Seems she has like, policies. Yes, she is a policy nerd. She seems like a very nice person. Uh, she seems like a delightful woman. I can't take her ploys to reach millennials it's just like your grandma doing funny things on instagram and every time i see her like working out on twitter or you're like that's cute cooking you're like oh it's cringe because it's like it'd be cute if my grandma but like it's so like self i don't know uh but the main thing you're going to hear about elizabeth warren is focahannis pocahannis it's it's everybody has a nickname it's the Native American thing. And so let's just give you a little, some details on exactly what happened there so you understand what, what went down. So her family has carried on a tradition that they have Native American history. Now, to defend Elizabeth Warren, I think every American family has something similar. I have been told my entire life that I am 116th Cherokee and Choctaw. I've repeated that a hundred thousand times over the course of my childhood. <laughs> I was I was told that and then I did my genealogy. <laughs> exactly. Thank you. And when my sister just did hers, we've been told we're German. We're like 80, 90 percent German and one sixteenth. Uh, I don't know the math, but German and Native American. And my sister did it and we're like mostly Swedish, <laughs> which I was so disappointed. Um and so we've always been told all these stories because people in the 1800s just made shit up. And so to defend her, I don't think that, like you said, Sarah, there's just not a family in America that doesn't have that lore about having Native American heritage. But she doubled down on it. She really did. <laughs> so this is the problem. That's where she went wrong. Like Mike Raby at Entercom, when he found out that I was working at the talk radio station, that I, I just, he heard, he passed me saying I had 116 Cherokee Choctaw blood. He, he noted me down as Native American in the EEOC file. <laughs> and so, like, that's the extent of my track record. I laughed because I thought it was funny. Elizabeth Warren went a little bit further. So, uh, recently released, uh, she recently released a DNA study saying she likely had a Native American relative between six and ten generations ago. One, one, one out of 1,024th jokes were rampant. Uh, she did not ever get a scholarship for being Native American. However, she did list it as a demographic information for her law school, Rutgers, and that would have been taken into account for both affirmative action and diversification. To be considered a Native American for these purposes, she would have had to be at least one-eighth Native American, which far more genetic correlation than even she knew she had. Um, she gave a recipe to a cookbook about traditional Native American cuisine. It was a chicken salad esque recipe and featured the use of mayo. Um, I guess Native American mayo. What was it called? It was like pow wow chow or something like really, like if you're Native American, it's the the like just not sensitive. It's a casserole. <laughs> But it was like the 80s or 90s, so let's everybody, everybody was racist in our grandparents' generation. Uh, Everybody's still racist. It's okay. She has frequently feel like what's that musical? Everybody's everyone's a little, a little bit racist. Yeah, <laughs> I definitely have the song playing in my head. It's okay. She has frequently spoken at events and was recognized officially during Indigenous Peoples Day. And Native Americans themselves follow cultural heritage instead of genetic heritage when recognizing belonging to a tribe to warren's credit she has always admitted this it's her claims to genetic heritage that have gotten her in trouble and she has always denied belonging to a tribe you know i applaud her for releasing her genetic information it it was 
either an act of bravery or stupidity to admit that six and ten generations ago you had a Native American. Uh, it was probably one of those things where she thought, I better just put this out and get this, get this, uh, get this out there so people just see it and know I did it before it leaks three years from now and everybody, oh, why'd you cover this up? So, but it was hilarious. The memes were amazing. Yeah. It, it was just, it made itself for memes. It's because it's so stupid. So uh, I do laugh every time Trump calls her Pocahontas, though. That's, that's probably my favorite Trump nickname. Uh, yeah. And I don't know why. It just, it, it hits me in my funny bone. Well, I mean, and that's, that's the thing is the silly thing when she ended up releasing the results is it's like, did you really need to give people more fodder for that? Like, we didn't need to keep talking about it. You could have just right. stepped away, not talked about your heritage anymore. Yeah. So, but she has been a consequential thing, uh, consequential senator. Um, I think she was she did she replace um, who was the handsome guy, the Republican that won in in uh, Scott Brown? I think she beat Scott Brown, or she replaced John Kerry when he became the uh, Secretary of State. Um, so she was appointed to several committees before she even became a senator. Uh, she. Uh, was on the National Bankruptcy Review Commission, the TARP Oversight Panel, and the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau was actually her idea, something that she wrote in a journal or a paper somewhere, and Barney Frank saw it and um, elevated it into his set of schemes that he wanted to reform. He's like, yes, let's make this happen. Exactly, and... And then all of a sudden she was this skyrocketing star in the Democratic Party and then ran for Senate. Uh, she was a Republican until 1996, and she cited market failures as her reason for switching parties. And she is the first female senator from Massachusetts. She gained national fame in 2013 when she questioned members of Wall Street while serving on the banking committee. Uh, she famously said, I, have really, I am really concerned that too big to fail has become too big for trial. Uh, thank you. That was a very good impression. She had one over 1 million views in 24 hours. Uh, an encounter, she had an encounter with the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve had been giving out loans to political sponsors and their business affiliates at a rate of 0.75 APR, where the average rate was 8.5%. After um, defaulting on the insanely low rate loans, they accepted settlements for small portions of the loans, and uh, putting two and two together, this amounted to giving away money to political allies for free, since the loans would be for million or even billions, and the settlements would be for a few thousand dollars. The practice still continues uh, to this day, but she's the one who really elevated this to public conscience. Warren protested the settlements and sending letters to Justice Department, Securities and Exchange Commissions, uh, members of the Federal Reserve, and in an act of protest, she drafted a bill to make student loans have the same rates as these allies were paying it at 0.75%. It didn't pass. It was never intended to pass, but it was intended to send a message. She's also a fundraising machine. And in both elections that she has run in, she set the record for donations to a Senate campaign. And um, I think she replaced Kerry when he became Secretary of State. And then I think she beat Scott Brown again oh, at some point that's that's my recollection um she the, the the like i said i mean i've used her as an example of never you never know where your career is going to end up i mean she wrote this paper barney frank noticed it he implemented this uh, consumer protection bureau uh, financial protection bureau which we've done an episode on it, it basically turned out <laughs> So she puts together this thing. She gets uh, elected as senator. She is in charge of putting together this, this uh, bureau that is going to protect. She's going to basically fight against what you just heard, political allies, big business, getting goodies from the federal government. So she creates the, this credit bureau. And, when, and the end result of it was basically a crony <laughs> capitalist central where she put in a lot of political allies uh, running this cr credit protection bureau. And it was, it was basically the democratic version of what the Republicans had been doing with some of these swaps. So you'll have to go back to, to get more of the details. It's been a couple of years since we did that episode. 
But uh, when Trump became president, there was a big controversy about it because he put uh, one of his people in charge of it. The the uh, head of it protested, said he was still the head, and and it basically has been completely neutered. But it was just sort what of what Chris a, is trying to say is that he will include a link in the show notes. That's a good point. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, this is why I like Sarah. She's much smarter than I am. Um, you just got to keep right. picking up the pace. You wanted to get through everybody. I know, but you know me. Uh, so let's go to Kamala Harris, Sarah. Oh, so Kamala Harris, what was that great reason um, front page <laughs> they had recently? Kamala, what is she, a cop who wants to be president? Kamala, Kamala Harris is a cop who wants to be president. And the cover this month of reason is so funny that when I, I pulled it out of my mailbox, I laughed out loud. And it's true. She's a cop that wants to be president. I, I thought it was a great summary. Yeah. She's, it, it was so good. But she is currently the senator from California. Uh, the reason we say she's a cop that wants to be president is before that, she was a district attorney of San Francisco. And when she was a district attorney, her highlights of success were she <laughs> increased the conviction rate from 52 to 67 percent, the highest in a decade, had an 85 for percent conviction rate among homicides and her drug crime convictions went from 56 to 74 percent uh i mean i might consider those failures in a way if you kind of consider incentives but what right. are kind of listed as failures here were her conviction rates were largely because of plea deals uh, of 73 first degree homicide convictions she accepted manslaughter third degree murder on 32 of them and second degree for nearly all of the others so she never actually took uh, those murder cases to trial. Right. So in 2012, Superior Court Judge Anne Christine Masulo ruled that San Francisco District Attorney Harris's uh, office had violated defendants' rights by hiding damaging information from police crime lab technicians, destroying evidence, and ignored demands from lawyers and judges in response to what happened to missing evidence. Uh, she opened a special hate crimes unit that focused on bullying LGBT kids. And when it was discovered that she defeated a bill that would have paid prisoners $1 per hour instead of 8 to 32 cents per hour for hard labor, she explained, the way that argument plays out in court does not reflect my priorities. The idea that we incarcerate people to have indentured servants is one of the worst possible perceptions. I feel very strongly about that. It evokes the image of chain gangs. But again, she made sure to kill a bill that would require her, them to pay uh, prisoners a whole dollar an hour. Right. <laughs> right. She, so, so her office made the argument that we, sh that, that we can't afford to run our prisons if we cannot keep them at the 8 to 32 cent um, range. But right. She's saying that that's not her personal opinion. That's just her office. Yeah. So uh, the Achilles Hills for, uh, and I should say for Elizabeth Warren is just that she has no charisma. The, the Achilles Hill for yeah. Kamala Harris is that she has no charisma and she flip-flops like crazy. So anytime she goes on CNN on one of these town halls and says something, within a, she says something controversial, and then her campaign tries to clean it up and backtracks. This is a pattern with Kamala Harris. She will, she will say, well, that's not what I meant. That's not what I meant is, like, should be her campaign slogan. Uh, I'm, I'm for poor people. Like, even, even down to, and I, I don't know if it's, I don't see it in the notes here, but you know, saying, I smoked pot in college. Yes. Uh, she said she smoked pot in college, and she remembers the days of listening to Tupac and Biggie while she smoked pot, and she was in college like a full six years before Tupac and Biggie even released their first album. Like, well, I meant... But yeah, let's, let's talk meant, about this while you were part of putting people in jail for doing exactly that. Exactly. You increased the amount of drug offenders that you put away. Like, it's... I don't know. She she just is. Uh, she's bad on criminal justice and bad on punishing the very people that she says she really cares about the most. Mm -hmm. um, and it's it's disingenuous. Right. So she is. She just seems like a liar. So she also led discussions to reach a settlement with five large banks in California, uh, getting them to pay twenty six billion dollars to homeowners and those affected by the subprime mortgage crisis. But in 2015, an appeals court actually summoned her for review of three different cases. In one, she had allowed fake confession to be used in court. In another, she committed perjury by telling a prosecutor to change his story based on evidence he wouldn't have known. By repeating his false testimony in court, she perjured herself. 
And in a third case, she gave evidence to a technician that was not obtained from the scene of the crime in order to make a fake, in order to make a fingerprint connection. And though guilty, a federal judge nullified any penalty she would have received, but Harris's uh, lawyers, but told Harris's lawyers to talk to the attorney general and make sure she understands the gravity of the situation. Mm -hmm. So it was literally a a slap on the wrist. It was go and make sure she understands what she did wrong. (laughs) Right. Uh, She made the actual first arrest of the back page CEO, Carl Ferrer. He was not convicted on this arrest and charges, but eventually pled guilty after another arrest for similar charges were filed. Um, Backpage was a site that unknowing, I mean, quote, unknowingly offered young prostitutes to buyers on top of illegal substance sales. It was right. Um, a, a Harris allegedly uh, alleged that 99% of the girls on the website were under 18. Um, that conflicts with some other accounts that they're made, but that was at least Harris's um, allegation. Mm-hmm. She was the first person of prominence to call uh, Trump's Muslim, uh, Trump's travel restrictions on two certain countries called him a Muslim ban. So she is responsible for that moniker. And in her most famous instance as senator, she questioned both James Comey and Jeff Sessions. And each time she was stopped by her colleagues for being mean during her questions. The media and the public at large saw this as sexist and possibly even racist. Uh, She was one of the ones who was able to ask questions of Brett Kavanaugh as well. Well, she was technically violating the rules of the Senate. And again, a lot of those people who claimed that she was being mean or sexist just kind of didn't know how the Senate worked. And she was... Well, the claim was that she was being mean, but that calling her out for being mean was sexist. The idea being like you wouldn't have called a man out for that. Right. When any of them, all of them were grandstanding. And that was sort of the Mm -hmm. point. Yeah. But I mean, lots of people called Cory Booker out for his grandstanding. Mm-hmm. It, 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 oh, his was bad. It was, comes up later. I'm Spartacus. Yeah, he's ridiculous. I, I used to love Cory Booker, but man, what a, <laughs> what a disappointing turn. Um, so there's lots of reasons to be disappointed in Kamala Harris. Yeah, so you're, this is going to come up in conserv- the conservative press, and you'll probably hear this. Um, in a 2019 interview, Kamala Harris said, I am black and I am proud of it. And uh, so this is from Wikipedia. So she was born in 64 to a Tamil Indian mother and a Jamaican father. Um, Her mother was a breast cancer scientist who immigrated to the U.S. from Madras. Uh, Her father, Donald Harris, is a Stanford University economics professor who immigrated from Jamaica in 61 for a graduate study at uh, USC Berkeley in economics. Uh, Recalling the lives of grandmothers, Donald Harris wrote that one of one that one was related to a plantation and slave owner while the other had unknown ancestry in 2019 uh, interview. Kamala Harris said, I am black and I am proud of it. Um, A lot of people in the conservative press, well, she's not black. She has an Indian mother. And it's, this is a thing that's always annoying with the difference between the way that Republicans and Democrats look at this issue mm -hmm. is that to Republicans, it's this issue of like of, of almost like blood where, oh, well, I'm sorry, how exactly much are you black? Where most Democrats consider it as, well, you're black if you were raised in a black family and if you have been subjected to the experience of black people in America because you are looked at by most people and seen that way. Yeah. And, and I think like Barack Obama, we dealt with this with Barack Obama and, and you just had yeah. to say, like when Barack Obama gets pulled over by a police officer, his experience is a lot more like Harry Price's than it is Chris Spangles. Exactly. (laughs) You know, and so there's uh, amongst the boomer class in society, a lot of misunderstanding or disinformation or just not giving a shit. I don't Mm -hmm. know what the the appropriate. Sometimes it seems like intentional misrepresentation too, though. But I mean, that can. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I just, sometimes I guess it can seem that way, but try to be more. Try to be more generous to them. <laughs> so the other thing is that she slept her way to the top. And so Kamala Harris, uh, I, I should have pulled this up, but basically the allegation is that she had sex with the mayor of San Francisco to get her position as the prosecutor in the district attorney in San Francisco. He basically wrote, which was like one of the most honest things I've ever seen a politician write. Yeah, we had an affair. <laughs> I cheated on my wife with her. For like nine months uh, and it didn't have anything to do with why I appointed her for district attorney. Um, I would encourage you to go look that up for yourself. Uh, but I, I mean, to me, it's like they both say they had a relationship. They both say that it had nothing to do with her becoming district attorney. 
I'm sure it didn't hurt, but at the same time, I think to to smear her and say that she only slept with this guy to get to this position mm-hmm. is really unfair because you don't really know. And so if you don't really know, and it, it's just sort of, it's dirty pool to begin with. And at the end of the day, it really is irrelevant in whether or not you would vote for this woman for president or not. Do you mm-hmm. agree with how she, how she actually uh, would craft legislation or not? And so again, it's just another one of these little things that you just go, this isn't important. Why are you bringing this up, Aunt Becky? Yeah. So, what about Mayor Pete? All right. Mayor Pete from South Bend, Indiana. Um, I've never met Mayor Pete. I might soon for one of the projects I'm working on. Um, by all accounts, it, it, from all He's of local, our, there's no excuse. Yeah. Uh, he's, he's a way up in South Bend, which I've never been there. Um, but he ran for uh, treasurer, state treasurer, uh, I think in 2010, 2012, somewhere around there. And by all accounts, he's a very nice man, very uh, intelligent, very well-spoken, um, and very well respected here in the state of Indiana. And it's always been puzzling to a lot of people in Indiana, like, why wouldn't you just take over the Indiana R- Democratic Party? Because there's really no party. Why would you run straight for president? Um, now, it is interesting to note that the Indiana Democrats have never run um, a governor, a gubernatorial candidate that is for same sex marriage. Uh, the libertarians have in Rupert Bonham. But the Democrats here in the state have never run someone who is for gay marriage. Now, why is that relevant? Because he's the first openly gay Democratic presidential candidate. He came is he out, gay married? He is very gay married. Uh, oh. He came out in 2015 while currently serving as mayor. He was, um, he was married. And Mike Pence wrote him a very nice congratulations letter for it, which you would never hear. We'll, we'll get to his... Like, God, I hate that I have to defend Mike Pence, but uh, his his flat out lies because I have some inside info on some of that stuff. Now, uh, he is gay married. In 2012, a tape never revealed to the public allegedly contained an exchange uh, between a black and white police officers where white officers used racial slurs. Now, how do you say Mayor Pete's last name? I say Buddha Judge. That's how I've heard it. Uh, That's how I've heard it too. All right, that's sort of Buddha Judge or Buddha Gag or. Mm. It has evolved here in Indiana, and that's another thing that nobody can figure out because he says it differently uh, now versus a few years ago. So Buddha Judge, which is what I'm going to go with until I'm corrected, uh, Buddha Judge demoted the black police chief and fired the black communications director, but did not issue any punishment towards the white police officers. He settled the issue with half a million taxpayer dollars with the two fired individuals. The Washington Post, Gov Fresh, and the New York Times have all at one time or another said he was the best mayor in America. Uh, by 2015, he accomplished 1,000 properties in 1,000 properties in 1,000 days, an initiative to either refurbish or demolish buildings in South Bend. Um, he served in the Navy Reserves and actually had to serve seven months in Afghanistan while he was mayor. Uh, and when he deployed to Afghanistan, Mike Pence wrote him another very nice note and wished Aww. him uh, completed a project that cost $25 million to add bike lanes and pedestrian crossing zones in South Bend. Um, there is a guy here who is the communications director for the Indiana Republican Party. His name is Pete Seat. Uh, he has written, if you're, if you're interested in getting the South Bend perspective and the Indiana Republican perspective on Pete, uh, on Pete Buttigieg, you can go look up Pete seat. Um, sounds just Pete seat. Like you'd sit on. Uh, and he's written some articles for local news outlets uh, about how his mayor, he's not the best mayor in America. Um, I, I think my, my take on Pete is a, I really don't like how he is. He, he's doing this thing that you see a lot of politicians do where we just need to come together. Meanwhile, I'm going to provoke the other side to, to get a response. Like his, his constant poking at Mike Pence, the two of them have never had anything but a cordial re- relationship. Um, I'm friends with the person who actually, you know, helped pen those letters to Pete Buttigieg. Uh, he, 
he and Mike Pence never had a contentious relationship, but the way that you hear Mayor Pete tell it is that the two were, that were constantly at odds and that Mike Pence is at odds with his creator and that uh, Mike Pence is kind of his foil and he's using it to elevate his, he knows he's going to get good press out of it. And he's intentionally lying about his relationship with Mike Pence to make Mike Pence look bad. And to me, it's just kind of dishonorable. And I know why he's doing it. It's because he gets good press and it's kind of getting him a following. And there's a car right now out in front of my apartment complex that has a Mayor Pete bumper sticker on it. Um, you know, he, he is a very intelligent person, Rhodes Scholar, and is uh, really in a lot of ways the future of the Democratic Party. And I think he's running this time to kind of build that organization, like we said about Bernie and Biden earlier to get some experience. I don't think he thinks he's going to be the nominee this time, but he's, he's building a network. He's building a power base. And in 20 years, he's going to be a very big player in democratic politics, if not president or, or something substantial. In a lot of ways, like if you were to make like a dating profile for a potential presidential candidate, like he would have the most amazing profile. Yes. He He would be that one who you're like, I'm intimidated to swipe right. Right. I mean, he, he is, he's, he just seems not crazy. <laughs> and not yeah, like, I mean, he does have a, a lot of very radical positions. I mean, he's, he's not that far off from, from a lot of the more, he's, he's a little further to the left and uh, he hides it well, though. He has that Midwestern charm. So I think he's going to be a big player. I don't think he's going to be a big player in this, but I do hate that he's doing that thing where, He's intentionally inflaming the other side while saying, we need to bring America together. It's like, well, then you need to walk the walk because you're just, he's just being dishonest about Mike Pence. And like Mike Pence is, is you, everything Mike Pence says he truly believes. And there's, he's not a hypocritical man. He's not cheating on his wife. He's not tapping on his feet in stalls. Like he's, Everybody in Indiana, like if they know Mike Pence and have had interactions with him as I have, you respect him because he's not a liar. He's just, he's just is who he is. I don't think he's that bright. I don't think he'd make a good president. I don't agree with his use of the government to try and force religious outcomes. But at the end of the day, the guy is, is not as he's not the hateful monster that he's made out to be. And it, and it, it's really unfortunate that Mayor Pete, who I was like, I, all right, I could respect this guy. He, I lost a lot of respect for him in the way that he handled this to try to get himself press. I just thought it was dishonorable. And I, I just sort of, I sort of expected better for exactly what you said, Sarah. He just has all those makings of somebody where you go, all right, it, it, like Cory Booker, here's a Democrat that I think that is level-headed, and then he just does this. Stuff. Oh, oh man! Don't be a piece of shit, please. Yeah. One. Do one not. Of you, just don't. One of you don't be a piece of shit. Oh, so is that my cue to talk about Beto? Yeah, but speaking of, don't be a piece of shit, <laughs> Beto O'Rourke. <laughs> so Beto was. They, I mean, you probably heard him. He's a media darling. He was the House of Representatives. Um, he was. He was in the House of Representatives in Texas from 2013 to 2016. And he gained national recognition for his speech about taking a knee during the anthem. He said that players should be recognized for protesting nonviolently, peacefully, while the eyes of the country are watching. And he very, very narrowly lost uh, the recent election against uh, Ted Cruz. Yep. He was one of the few on the list who has extensive liberal arts experience. Uh, he, he bounced around several bands during and after college. Bands like The Fragile Gang and The Sheeps. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm I'm taking special my, appreciation of the sheeps. Here's my thing about Beto is he reminds me of Jim for Jim from the office ran for president. Mm. Like he, that's yeah. sort of his vibe. Uh, he wrote short stories and songs. After that, he later moved on to moving art pieces and he became a full-time caretaker for hire. Uh, he eventually moved on to uh, internet service provider work. He actually founded his own ISP company called the Stanton Street Tech- Technology Group. And he still runs and operates it today with his wife, uh, taking the reins after he started running for office. But there is, of course, controversy to be had for Beto. Absolutely. We've got to have something for everybody. Racial controversy. 
Oh yeah. Well, he's a white guy, so there's got he's got to be racist somewhere, right, Sarah? Well, he's a white guy who's calling himself Beto. Right. So to be fair, uh, he has explain always. Beto. Can you explain Beto? Because uh, you seem like you're down with Hispanic heritage. <laughs> so Beto is in this case it was a nickname that he's just kind of had through his childhood, but his name is is Robert. Um. Robert I mean, it's a, Francis O'Rourke, as Rush calls him. It's a, I mean, it's a common, it's a common nickname for for Robert or Roberto. It's it's Beto. Um, to he's always claimed to have no Hispanic heritage, though, but he was still raised within the culture. So you know how like sometimes you can be raised within a culture that you're not necessarily ethnically right belonging to. You know, if you were raised in a black community, you may be very comfortable within black culture. Well, I mean, for instance, I was raised in white culture, but I'm Native American. Well, but you were not raised in Native American culture, so you might not have an understanding of that. I know. I, I need to get to know my people. <laughs> uh, go to more powwows. <laughs> uh, but in, in fact, actually, what was they uh, ended up releasing a picture of Beto as a toddler in a little jacket that said Beto to prove, like, this is a lifelong nickname. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> because the, I mean, the allegation was, oh, you're just trying to pander to the Hispanic community. And it has actually backfired a little bit. I mean, Ted Cruz, one of his strongest voting blocks for Ted Cruz was Hispanics. And some people did cite that they felt that he was trying to pander to them. And so that line of argument did work in, in Texas, even if it's not totally the truth. Um, and so after the defeat of his opponent in the election, the Congressional Hispanic Caucus noted that they were losing a member. After discussing it with O'Rourke, they decided to change the bylaws to allow him to become a member because he represented a district that was over 80% Hispanic. So that's kind of what we were talking about, where you can grow up in a community even though you're not ethnically a member of that community you still you know you still get a nickname <laughs> right uh o'rourke simply stated that he respected the caucus's bylaws uh, he does occasionally get to be a renegade though oh. and, you know everybody loves everybody loves a rebel um he initially did not support clinton but eventually did uh he was kind of one of the last ones to jump on board he endorsed tim ryan to defeat nancy pelosi as the speaker of the house he, he's saying it's time for new leadership. But, yeah. So he occasionally will go against the grain, but it, he still has a habit of eventually falling in line. He's been criticized by a lot of people for cursing uh, at, at his rallies. You know, these Democrats, they are just, they're getting potty mouthed. Just, I, I mean, I personally don't care. Like, I, like the idea of the respectable politician, the statesman, uh, like George H.W. Bush, it's like, yeah, they're all just pushing death and murder. Like, uh, Are you going to join the Audacious Caucus? Yes, I am. I'm going to wave a big dildo around at the next <sighs> convention like, like our buddies uh, in the Audacious Caucus. But um, James, James Weeks, a lovely man, I will say that. Uh, he's, he, he, they only drive me crazy a little. I know, I know. Uh, and I feel bad. Like, part of me, James never should have done that. I don't know if he's apologized for it but it, that's like the statue of limitations at some point needs to be up for a him but also every libertarian well you had a naked guy dance on stage it's like well you have donald trump as president so yeah go fuck yourself uh you had a warmonger on stage right. you want to talk right uh but he, here's here's the thing about beto is he doesn't strike you as like a statesman he doesn't strike you as a politician he's like your buddy He's like your your college frat friend who like sells insurance and kind of hates his job and ignores his wife while he plays video games. It's mm -hmm. like I don't know. It's he just seems like you can take the everyman shtick too far. And when you're yeah. when you're Instagram living your dentist appointment and talking, you know, it's just like I don't know. I don't want to see Here, my let me cook for you. Right. I don't want to see my president doing all this normal rad stuff like Obama. They're all trying to be Obama. And it just doesn't doesn't work like the, the here's, second year of Canada. Here's my my appeal to Democrats is stop. Please, please, please stop cooking dinner on Instagram. Yes, um, it's done. It's enough. Even but this thing, even Obama, like he was good at social media because he was naturally good at it. But like even when he was leaning into and trying to, you know, engage with social media, he made a joke out of the fact that like. He's an old guy trying to learn social media. I right. mean, he released a video of himself like walking around the White House with a selfie stick at one point. Like, that's a great way to to frame that. It's not the way that the current candidates are. They're trying to be like, 
hey guys, we're hip. We know what to do. Yeah, and it does suck. Like I'm 35 and like I know that I've just kind of aged out of certain things. Like I just can't. I still don't quite get Snapchat. I try. Yeah, I'm like, I, I like TikTok. I just can't. I can't post anything on TikTok. I'm too old for it now. I'm I'm a little too like I'm laughing at memes that are boomer memes. Like I'm getting concerned about myself, Sarah. I, I really am. You'll see once you get older, you start to go, I'm 35 now, and I thought that that meme was funny, and this is clearly a boomer meme. Help. So. I, I do get really worried. I'm like, one of these days I'm gonna turn 30, it's gonna be terrible. <laughs> your life will all fall apart. Now the 30s are great. Mm. Much better than your horrible twenties. Um, so next, make your up, mistakes. next up is Cory Booker. Now, I have followed Cory Booker's career for a very long time. I rented a DVD from, my, from the Plainfield Public Library where I grew up. Uh, it's probably the early 2000s, mid-2000s, called Street Fight, and it was about Cory Booker's first uh, run for Newark mayor in New Jersey, and he lost. Uh, spoiler alert. But he was, uh, I mean, this was like early 2000s when he ran this race and running against this like democratic machine and it was a brilliant move like here's a guy here here's just like at the time a republican sitting in indiana watching a a documentary about a democrat in new jersey going i like that guy i would vote for that guy you know and he he has been on my radar for a very long time he became senator started working with Rand paul on on some things you know, seemed to be very uh, cordial and, and willing to work with the other side. And then he decided to run for president, and he's just turned into a maniac. And I don't, I don't know what happened to the Cory Booker that I, I liked. Um, I thought that he had a lot of potential. I thought that he had a lot of Obama-type qualities where he was just a regular guy who you could see being – he had that blend of leader and regular person that you could relate to. And then he's just kind of he's just kind of a weirdo. Like, I don't know. I don't know if you get the weirdo vibe from him, but he's just a weirdo. Uh, so let's. Uh, I kind of like him, but he's definitely a, 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 he's not good at grandstanding, but he tries to, and yeah. that's not a good combination. That's it. He's a tryhard. <laughs> yes. That's, yes, that's the the Achilles heel for Corey is that he's a tryhard, and he's just like that guy who's trying too hard to fit in, and you just go, dude. If you're just yourself, we'd like you, but the fake act, I just can't take. So let's jump into the notes here. He was the mayor of Newark. Uh, He made headlines when he showed up to shovel snow off of driveways and city streets when the city failed to show up to some residences. Uh, He then became the senator from New Jersey, once a friend of the Freedom Caucus in the House. He once referred to himself as a libertarian. He ended up rejecting them and then some. The New York Times ranked his voting record as the third most liberal, He also did not register a single vote outside the party lines during his tenure. Uh, This tells you enough about his stances on the issues. He's part of the, quote, hell no caucus that is dedicated to rejecting any administrator Trump selects. Uh, And then there was the Kavanaugh incident, as we call it here. Um, He, Booker, declared that he was going to release documents showing Kavanaugh supporting racial profiling after September 11th and also announced that he... What he was doing was illegal. In fact, the documents had already been released with Kavanaugh's permission the day before through a committee member, Chuck Grassley. And even his own party said that he was engaging in three, three theatrics and histrionics. He called histrionics. Himself, histrionics. He called himself Spartacus. He was pounding the table. It was very odd. Uh, and he's also dating Rosario Dawson, which means that if he were elected president, I will have seen... Two first ladies nude, so. <laughs> Rosario. Well, we got to keep a trend. Yeah, I mean, honestly. I mean, you go You from can't both. go backwards. It's not that Laura Bush isn't attractive. <laughs> you just can't go backwards. Yeah, you can't go backwards. So, um, so that is Cory Booker in a nutshell. Uh, let's, let's just, unless you have thoughts on Cory, and if not, go on. Um, I mean, the Democratic objections I've heard on Cory is, is his stance on health care is... Uh, He's a little bit more free market on healthcare, which would make libertarians, you know, like him a little bit more. But he votes against like price controls on um, prescription medications, for example, which right. doesn't earn him exactly a lot of points among Democrats, but not a terrible thing. Yeah. All right. So Amy Klobuchar. 
the senator from Minnesota. Uh, so according to Rasmussen, her 67% approval rating in 2010 uh, led all senators for the year. She was the most popular senator. Hmm. Okay. In 2016, she broke the record for being legislator voting to pass the most measures of all time. Uh, and that means she voted yes a lot, both Republican and Democrat. Uh, she sponsored 111 bills and approved of a, a Democrat high 31.1% of Trump's bills. Hmm. So she's not, she's not an obstructionist. In fact, if anything, she's the opposite. She's, she's very much, um, she's willing to work with the other side. She's a little more moderate. And she's, she's just sort of a Midwestern Democrat, especially from Minnesota. They, they really do have a type up there uh, where yeah. Minnesota Democrats are much more independent, fiercely independent, much more um, thoughtful and willing to work with the other side, but also very progressive on certain issues, uh, especially unions and, and labor. So, uh, so some of the concerns about her, though, attacks have been that she does not treat her staff well, apparently. Yeah. Uh, so according to a BuzzFeed report, taken with a grain of salt, uh, she, her, office, her congressional office was controlled by fear, anger, and shame. Uh, she was listed as one of the worst bosses in Congress with an annual staff turnover rate between 2011 and 2016 of 36%, which was the highest of any senator, <laughs> which just kind of an interesting comparison if she's the most popular among voters, but not necessarily among people who have to work with her. Yeah, if you want to see BuzzFeed's ethics, go read um, who's the the guru that just released the thing, Tony Robbins. Oh, yeah. An article about BuzzFeed's reporting and their smear piece on him saying the N-word and like, he took him to the woodshed and I was cheering because they're the absolute, like if BuzzFeed, a, no offense to Sam or Hody, whoever picked BuzzFeed as a source, but at the end of the day, there is, this is the vibe that you get from, from a lot of our staffers. They say she's just difficult. Wasn't she the one where there was a story where she got mad at somebody for not getting um, utensils to eat her salad with and ended up <laughs> eating her salad with a, uh, a comb, which I just have to say, as somebody who travels a lot and has run into an I don't have silverware problem before, this is create problem solving. I mean, a comb, though. <laughs> <laughs> it works as a fork. Yeah. Um, so she also gained some notoriety, though, during, again, the Kavanaugh hearing. Uh, she was the senator who accused him of being a blackout drinker which resulted in Kavanaugh getting a little bit heated and then apologizing. Yeah, I forgot yes, about that. Forgot do you, the one that tripped that wire, yeah. Do you black out? I, I never black out. <laughs> I have never blacked out. I don't know. I don't know, Senator. Do you have a drinking problem? Right. I mean, <laughs> I get that he should, he, A, he shouldn't have lost his temperament. But, like, I can't imagine the stress that like both Kavanaugh and Blasey Ford, like I think about that whole era, that whole month. And I just go, I mean, Sarah, you know me well enough to know how I, I'd be screaming this. I'd be, I'd lose my mind. I would, I don't know. I, I, like you accuse me of having a drinking problem out of nowhere. It's just like at some point you sort of snap. Yeah. Then, you know, it is. It's like, well, do you have a drinking problem? <laughs> it's, it's kind of funny. <laughs> All right. So we're getting we're getting down to the wire now. Those are those are kind of the more top level candidates that you're gonna hear more about that the media has been focusing on, um, aside from Yang, which we haven't covered yet. Um, so we want to kind of try and run through a little rapid fire with the rest of them. Yeah, let's uh, because we got to talk about Yang and Gabbard especially. But Julian, oh yes, I forgot about Gabbard. Yes. Uh, so you'll do Yang. I'll start with Julian Castro. Um, Obama's Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, HUD, uh, former mayor of San Antonio, gave the DNC keynote address in 2012. He accidentally violated the Hatch Act by supporting Hillary Clinton for president while still a cabinet member. He was not punished, but he did order his staff to receive extra training on the Hatch Act. Uh, <laughs> as Secretary of HUD successes, he spent a billion dollars to restore cities hit by natural disasters. Excuse me. Um, expanded the Fair Housing Act to require establishments to report mortgage approval rates to the federal government, making sure that all ethnicities had the same approval denial rate, regardless of credit or qualifications, as is outlined by the FHA. Mm -hmm. Now, as failures, as detailed in Thomas Sowell's Basic Economics, the HUD built more public housing and orchestrated. <laughs> that's just how Rody wrote it. The HUD built more public housing and orchestrated fixed rent control pricing, but it expanded homelessness and accelerated gentrification. Cost of living in urban areas exploded under his tenure. 
Uh, next up on the third tier, let's say, is Andrew Yang. Andrew Yang, he is the UBI guy. Uh, he's also the founder of Venture for America. Their goal is to create economic opportunity in American cities by mobilizing the next generation of entrepreneurs and equipping them with the skills and resources they need to create jobs. It's a great mission statement. Mm -hmm. uh, Venture for America was launched with $200,000 and trained 40 graduates in 2012 and 69 in 2013, sending them to major cities. He also wrote a book called Smart People Should Build Things where he argues that the top universities in the country cherry pick the smartest kids out of small towns and funnel them into the same corporate jobs in the same big cities. Uh, he's pretty much the one thing he is known for is that he supports a UBI, specifically $1,000 to every American every month if he's elected. Um, originally not suggested as part of the UBI, but to help offset jobs threatened by automation and then expand it to everyone. Now, if you want to know more about that, uh, the boss hog of Liberty, it's already posted on their feed, but it'll be a daily episode here in the next um, uh, really couple days, I think. Uh, Eric Schonsberg, an economics professor from Southern Indiana, was on talking about Andrew Yang's proposal. And so you'll get a, a, a nice double dose. So when you see that hit your feed, uh, then check it out. Uh, anything to add on Yang, Sarah? And no, I mean, he, he, hasn't, he hasn't really broken down his proposal of how he's going to give everybody $1,000. Um, you just do it. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, that's just true. magically. Do it, right. The AOC plan. You just do I, it. See, I'm one of those terrible libertarians where I'm like, I am partial to a UBI, but like, you're going to have to get rid of the whole welfare programs in order to do that. Like all of, all of our current in-kind programs that they're going to have to go, go into it. Right. And that's never going to happen. So I, I've heard libertarian <laughs> arguments for it and against it. So I, yeah. I don't think you're a terrible libertarian, but I'm sure Arvin disagrees. I'm sure. So tell me about Tulsi. All right. Tulsi Gabbard uh, has captured the hearts and minds of many people, including oh. uh, our own Ron Paul. Uh, he is in Lions of Liberty, apparently. A uh, representative from Hawaii, uh, former vice chair of the DNC. She resigned to support Bernie Sanders. She is both the first Samoan American and the first Hindu to be elected to Congress. Uh, she proposed the Helping Heroes Fly Act, which created a special screening station for severely wounded veterans and commercial airports. It passed unanimously and was signed into law. Uh, Co-sponsored the Filipino Veterans of World War II uh, Congressional Medal, Gold Medal Act, which passed. It gave Filipino veterans medals of honor. A uh, great series on Netflix called Medals of Honor about Medal of Honor winners. Go check that out. She criticized Clinton and Obama saying, if you or I gave money, weapons, or support to Al-Qaeda or ISIS, we would be thrown in jail. Yet the U.S. government has been violating this law for years, quietly supporting allies and partners of Al-Qaeda, ISIL, and other terrorist groups with money, weapons, and intelligence, intelligence support in their fight to overthrow the Syrian government. Uh, her policies are classically socialist. She supports $15 an hour minimum wage, universal health care, free college, and additional private business regulation. She also is for the Green New Deal. Now, uh, there is a spat between my fellow uh, League of Liberty members, Roger Paxton and uh, Mark Clare over Tulsi Gabbard. Mark and some of the, the Lions of Liberty crew went to a Tulsi Gabbard uh, event and said nice things about her, and uh, Roger declared them Impure. How dare they? Uh, but I will say, if you want to know more of about Tulsi Gabbard or Andrew Yang, they both did an interview with Rogan, so that's like eight hours of content there. But uh, Roger Paxton on the Lava Flow actually did a really good breakdown of why you should not support uh, Tulsi Gabbard uh, from an economics and, and just a general perspective, and then also some surprising things in her foreign policy. The thing that kind of set it off is that she has been non-interventionist but she doesn't have a great, she doesn't have a spotless track record when it comes to supporting non-interventionists. Just she's really good on non-interventionist policy when a Republican is in the White mm -hmm. House. But when Obama was in the White House, she wasn't, uh, didn't have a great track record. And here's the thing. I think Roger was totally right. I don't think that a libertarian can support Tulsi Gabbard. I think it's, it's fair to say what Ron Paul said in an interview. He was asked the question. Is there any Democrat that you could see yourself supporting or what do you think of the field? And he said, um, of the candidates, I think Tulsi Gabbard is probably the best on foreign policy. And so I want to see her win, which is a perfectly reasonable thing to say. But 
uh, and I I'm, don't say the cult of Ron Paul to smear Ron Paul because I'm here because of Ron Paul, but there is a cult around Ron Paul. Uh, and all of the sudden, New Hampshire people and, and anarchists are sign-waving in New Hampshire for Tulsi Gabbard because Ron Paul, a Republican-elected congressman, who apparently gets anarchists to do whatever he wants them to do, despite his statism. Um, so Roger was triggered and, and did a great breakdown of why Tulsi Gabbard is not the great white hope for libertarians on the Democratic side. In reality, Tulsi's policies really, she's like Bernie Sanders. I mean, Sanders is fairly non-interventionist, but he's a complete socialist on so many different things. So I don't get the... You know, Ron Paul answered a simple question and basically said, like, if we have to have a Democrat, she'd be the good one, Mm -hmm. which is reasonable. He didn't say go support her. And then all of a sudden it like echoes five days later and everybody's supporting Tulsi Gabbard. And I don't get it because her policies really are in line with Bernie Sanders. And if and if I said I'm going to a Bernie Sanders rally and he had some good ideas, I would be run out of the party, Sarah. Probably. Yeah. Like, here's the thing. Here's the crazy thing, Sarah. The same people who are sign waving for Tulsi Gabbard probably said fuck Bill Weld 8,000 times in the last two years. And Bill Weld probably agrees with them 75% on the issues and Tulsi Gabbard 20% on the issues. But because she's good on one policy, one piece of the puzzle, she's, she's good, but he's the devil. And I'm not sticking up for Bill Weld. I'm saying... There's a hypocrisy there that I, I don't get with libertarians where it's like you'll hate your own, but then you'll say nice things about this person who almost doesn't agree with you in any way, mm-hmm. shape, or form. Yeah. Well, we all have that's a my Tulsi, That's my Tulsi hunk. I don't know what you think about her. Or what... <laughs> so I, don't, I don't think I have much more opinions than all of that. I have a lot to say. <laughs> I can tell. All right. So tell us about Tim Ryan then. Oh, uh, Tim Ryan... Who? We're going to skip over uh, Kirsten Gillibrand? Oh, did we? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see her there. You're just trying to skip over Kirsten. Yeah, she's a woman, so I don't want to hear it. <sighs> I can ahead. tell. Yes, go ahead, please. <laughs> she is the representative from New York. Uh, early in her career, she was a member of the conservative Blue Dog Democrats. I'm not sure those exist anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Later on, she shifted her views and left that faction calling for the abolition of guns, for a jobs guarantee, and changed her stance on Don't Ask, Don't Tell to repeal it. She was a leading voice in condemning sexual harassment in the military, and she called for Al Franken and Bill Clinton to stay out of the picture for their sexual harassment in the past. Uh, She sponsored a bill with Ted Cruz and Rand Paul to remove sexual assault cases to be dealt with by the chain of command. Uh, The bill failed, but it brought her name to prominence since it was viewed favorably by the public, even if Congress didn't pass it. The idea was sexual assault cases shouldn't just be handled within military court. They should be handled as sexual assault cases. Uh, and in 2018, she detained her journey. Uh, she detailed, sorry, not detained. Too much libertarianism. Yeah. Uh, in 2018, she detailed her journey from conservative Democrat to a member of the Hell No Caucus that just opposes every policy and nomination Trump puts forward. She said she was embarrassed and ashamed to have ever been conservative on any issues. <laughs> uh, she's also, I was trying to look it up while you talked, but, but um, she also had one of those slept her way to the top scandals which she's an attractive female that that's right. that's the annoying thing is if you're attractive and female and successful somebody is going to say you probably slept your way to the top here's the thing i've noticed this in sports journalism because i'm in the media business mm-hmm. and i've spent a lot of time around journalists and reporters in the media industry here in town and it's a very you know with a nfl team and the indianapolis motor speedway and so we have a, a lot of sports reporters and what you learn in any male-dominated industry is that inevitably, when there is a new female sports reporter, one of these older sports reporters that you see on your TV that feels threatened by the person who doesn't have their experience and looks more attractive, they feel threatened by that. And so then all of a sudden you hear, you know, she had sex with this coach or she had sex with three players or like it, all of a sudden they all sort of did something or mm-hmm. it, well it, and you know it's a problematic double standard because the position it puts 
the position that puts any female in, I mean, and it's, it's really bad in politics too, right. is you're not allowed to actually have any sort of romantic or sexual relationship with any of right. your coworkers. It's yeah. okay for all the guys to, because all the people they're hitting on are probably subordinates. They're not people who could actually give them any benefit. But, you know, Man, if you're... In the, in, the, in the face that I am thinking of, that guy... Uh, how he hasn't been me too who who is the progenitor of so many of these rumors about other female reporters i mean how he, he it is it's it's you're so right like they use their position so often sorry <laughs> you just got no excited. but it's but it's it's something that only gets thrown at 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 attractive females it's like not even necessarily just successful but any if you're successful and attractive uh, clearly you couldn't have gotten to where you are unless you had sex with somebody right so sorry, I'm not, my I'm, soapbox there. No, it's okay. I'm not saying <laughs> that there there are women who I had a conversation with uh, somebody recently, and they're like, "Well, I don't want people to think that I use my femininity or my looks to get this job." And I go, "The amount of people that actually sleep their way to the top is so minuscule, mm -hmm. and everybody knows when it actually does happen." Mm -hmm. Well, and and you bottom. get. When it actually does happen and when there's, you know, people talking about it a lot, like it really does undercut the, you know, your person's career. Like you don't right. necessarily get to the top if you're trying to sleep your way there. Right. Which is why it's such an effective weapon to try and bring someone down. Exactly. And so a lot of times you hear that in male dominated industries, you hear that rumor and a lot of times it's just not true. And so if, if it is true or isn't true, if, Christian Gillibrand or Kamala Harris slept their way into a position. Uh, does it really, at the end of the day, matter? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, so yeah, you they're not sleeping their way into this one. They're, right, they're not going to have sex with 360 million people to get into the White House. Although, I'm rooting for Stormy. Daniels. I mean, I would be first openly bisexual uh, candidate. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I, I don't know. I just look at this and I go, all right. I've heard this so many times about women that I know, like chaste women that I know that are not doing this mm -hmm. in, in this one industry. And, and it's probably the same in politics. You hear it all the time in politics too. And here's the thing about politics. If you work on a campaign and you're like, you're on one of these major campaigns, like you only see the people you work with. And a lot of times it's people in their early twenties yeah, it's young, attractive people. Like, it, right. it happens. Right. And so <laughs> there's a lot of sex in politics. I mean, politics, next to the Dungeons and Dragons and furry crowd, politicos are the horniest, drunkest people I've ever met. Oh, yes. So uh, at the end of the day, you really have to go, does this matter? And just don't spread that shit. Like, I'd be a decent person. So you wouldn't well, want to say that about your wife or daughter. Before we tangent too much... Tell us about Tim Ryan. All right, Tim Ryan. Go uh, back to boring white guys. Yeah, boring white guy. Tim Ryan, Ohio, Ohio House of Representatives since 2013. Most notable for running against Nancy Pelosi in the Speaker of the House race. Also notable that he ended up having a change of heart and voted for her himself when the vote was called. Changed from pro-life to pro-choice in 2015. Now supports federal funding for abortions. Supports increasing all business taxes, even on small businesses. Bold stance, Cotton. Mm -hmm. In an October 2010 interview with conservative magazine Human Events, Ryan said the tax increases on small businesses were necessary, quote, because we have huge deficits. We got to shore up Social Security. We got to shrink our deficits. Uh, made an odd name for himself in 2004 when he delivered a passionate speech criticizing Bush for not reinstating the draft. Uh, supports tariffs against countries that manipulate their currency. Uh, tell us about Bill de Blasio, please. Uh, Mayor of New York. Mayor de Blasio since 2014. Uh, he previously was also a campaign manager for both Hillary Clinton and Charles Rangel. He is the leader in police reform. He established the de-escalation tactics for the NYPD. He reduced the quantity of possession of prosecution over arrest related to cannabis, um, both possession and sale, actually, from my understanding. But he also mandated uh, body cameras for all of his officers, and he ended the mandate that placed all Muslim New Yorkers under surveillance. He also signed a bill guaranteeing free pre-K within the city of New York, and as a result, all pre-K programs not conducted online or by the public school left or closed down. Uh, 
part of that, from what I understand, had to do with with just the the sorry, I, coming from that childcare realm, it just the regulations that were put in that were so heavy. It was, it was pretty much impossible for anybody who wasn't state run to continue functioning. He also uh, attempted to institute a local millionaire tax, but that was struck down by Governor Cuomo. Uh, and de Blasi and Cuomo have a notable feud on many issues. New York notoriously takes from the upstate and siphons it into the city for projects. And de Blasio, who's a native of Manhattan, wants to see more of those funds since he believes strengthening New York City strengthens the whole state. Um, Cuomo pushes back because the counties of Western New York have the highest tax rates in the entire nation by substantial margins. Yeah. West, Western New York is the opposite side of New York from New York City, for those of you who are geographically challenged. <laughs> uh, and this is a very common thing. Like here in Indiana, everybody says, well, Indianapolis gets whatever they want. Well, they're also 25% of the state's revenue. So mm -hmm. there's, there's always that pushback between the rural areas and the, the big city. But in this case, with, with New York, you've run into an issue where a lot of the tax base doesn't necessarily come from the city, but it comes from the western part of the state. Right. And all of the funds that are funneled into the city for different projects. Now, now Andrew Cuomo was also thinking about running for president and then declined. Uh, he had just won re-election and said he wasn't going to do it. So obviously two big egos. So anytime you get two big egos like that, they, they always fight. Yeah. And so de Blasio referred to New York as a tale of two cities with a gap between the rich and the poor. So to fix the dichotomy, he's called for complete urban planning, freezing all rent prices, end to privatization, and a ban on private schooling, homeschooling, and internet classes. Oh, okay. So he wants to ban... Uh, Warehouse the children. Right, right. Uh, all of them. We can't possibly have any left. Seth Moulton, representative from Massachusetts, winner of the Medal of Valor by the Navy and Marine Corps for going back to rescue an injured comrade during his time fighting in the war in Iraq, part of the invasion of Baghdad, started his own show called Moulton and Mohammed with his interpreter in Iraq, Mohammed Harba. I, might, I want to listen to that, actually. Uh, detailed the issues ongoing in Iraq due to American occupation. His work was featured heavily in the Academy Award-nominated series No End in Sight, also about the problems with ongoing Iraqi occupation. Even so, he did support troop occupation until 2014 when he first voted against sending additional troops uh, for the first time. Uh, popularity for being outspoken in Massachusetts regularly compares Trump to Hitler. Yawn. Appeared on the cover of a local magazine saying, no civilian should own this gun with a handgun. Supports the more audacious points within the Green New Deal, including banning airline travel. Okay. All right. If you, if you think it was it's weird, really going to impact my job. Yeah. If you think it's weird with Sean Moulton, let's get to Marianne Williamson. Yeah. We're, we're moving very far away from the <laughs> center normal part of the party. Right. Marianne Williamson. Point, we're the, way below 0.1% now. She is a spiritual teacher and author. She's appeared on Oprah several, oh, Oprah, Oprah several times, also Real Time and Good Morning America. She's calling for a moral and spiritual awakening in the country. She says, it is a task of our generation to recreate the American uh, politia, to awaken from our culture of distraction and re-engage the process of democracy with soulfulness and hope. Yes, we see there are problems in the world, but we believe in a universal force that when activated by the human heart has the power to make all things right, such as the divine authority of love to renew the heart, renew the nations, and ultimately renew the world. So that kind of gives you an idea of, of her, her policy stances. Uh -huh. They're not particularly well fleshed out. Yeah, I thought I was reading Healing Our World by Mary. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I'm sorry. That's, that is not healing the world. That's healing the souls of America. I know. I'm teasing. I love Mary Roar. <laughs> I'm just teasing. Uh, she did study philosophy and theater in college, but she dropped out to become a cabaret singer. Uh, and, but she has been involved in starting a lot of different charities and organizations, uh, centers, for Living, which is a refuge for people with HIV AIDS, uh, Project Angel Food, which provides over 12,000 meals per week to those with life-threatening illnesses, Sister Giant Conferences, which are women's advocacy seminars that encourage women to run for office, the Peace Alliance, which is an advocacy group to encourage peace building and international relationships, and um, the results are she lobbies officials and speaks in the media about poverty-related solutions for results. Uh, there's also Lo the Love America tour in 2018, where she set out to speak about 
our own disconnections from the political process, the lack of knowledge of how our system operates, the lack of understanding of our history and confusion about many of the issues that confront us now. They've led to many cases, uh, in many cases, to a dangerous emotional disconnection between our country and ourselves. Otherwise, she's a pretty standard socialist. She supports $15 minimum wage, the Green New Deal, Sanders' health care plan for all. But, of course, not really with much specifics on how exactly you'd make those work. She's uh, the least objectionable so far. <laughs> yeah, but that's because she's all fluff. She's, she's also polling higher than what we're about to get to. The senator from Colorado, a representative from Maryland, uh, the, a member of, from California of the representatives, governor of Colorado. Oh, all these I, people are worse than a spiritual awakening. Another representative. Like, yeah, like she, I know, she's polling higher than these people. But uh, I guess she, name IDs all that matters in politics. Uh, so I, men- I mentioned that senator from Colorado. It is Michael Bennett. Mixed record on the issues, according to libertarians. Uh, C-plus from the NRA voted against the federal assault weapons ban. Supports universal background checks. He urged the USDA to subsidize dairy more. Ugh. Co-sponsor of the Marriage of the Equality Act, uh, which supports same-sex marriage. Supported it, the Affordable Care Act, but with major caveats. Said fixing the ACA was next to impossible because of how badly it was written with the incorporation of bribes money sent to phantom districts and projects placed into the bill itself. He opposed Sanders' Medicare for All bill, countered that bill with his own. Medicare X, co-wrote with Tim Kaine, aims to work like the free marketplace, but replace all private insurance with providers with public ones. So it's absolutely nothing like the free market. Uh, would use Medicare pre-ACA and the free market model to base prices and procedures on. Uh, was part of four Democrats and four Republicans who were willing to exchange funding for the wall in exchange for amnesty for those who are already here, supported eminent domain for the Keystone Pipeline, but also supports tax credits for solar manufacturers, supports foreign aid, but has opposed intervention in Yemen. And that leads us to John Delaney. The representative from Maryland. He started in business, founded two companies focused on small income households. One was for healthcare, the other was for loans. Both received awards from New York Stock Exchange, and they were absorbed by big banks after he stopped being their CEO. There was controversy on his first election because his district was gerrymandered prior to his election. Governor Martin O'Malley later admitted uh, the, re- the redrawn districts would favor Democrats. That was my hope, O'Malley told attorneys in a, disp- in a deposition. At least O'Malley's honest. Hey, I come from North Carolina. We're real honest about this here. <laughs> Uh, it was also my intent to create a district where people would be more likely to elect a Democrat than a Republican. Uh, he wrote the Open Our Democracy Act of 2017, which would have allowed all Republican or Democrat voters to vote in any primary, uh, create independent councils to gerrymandered districts, or I guess to un-gerrymandered districts. Uh, it was submitted, but it never got around to putting it up for vote. According to the Bipartisan Index and GovTrack, he was ranked 53rd most bipartisan members of Congress and the third most bipartisan Democrat. His only proposed legislation as a candidate is a 23% corporate tax increase to pay for infrastructure. All right. So next up is Steve Bullock, governor of Montana since 2012, former attorney general of Montana. As AG, he increased prison time for prescription drug abuse and increased sentences for drunk driving convictions. He broke apart big business under monopoly laws, stopped the merger from two meatpacking companies, forced the railroad to sell assets to competitors. FedEx had to give a portion of their shipping business to be completed by local businesses and passed a rule that all repeat DUI offenders must pass a breathalyzer twice every day. Passed a rule that reinstated Citizens United decision, which banned corporate campaign expenditures. The Supreme Court struck down Bullock's rule by a 5-4 decision. Though an active AG, Bullock was far less active as governor. While he expresses support for the liberal side of virtually every issue, Bullock has passed less legislation than any other governor during the length of his term. I think we have found our guy. I think, I think I'm in. This guy knows how to say no. Yes. Uh, while uh, supporting government interventions, especially into business, a key to his popularity, fourth highest in the nation, is a p- opposition from doing so from the governor's desk. Instead, he allows the AG and other offices to pass bills and either signs or vetoes them when they get to his desk. So he knows his role. He, he like, but he's clearly like a scary dude. Like some of that is just, yeah. Wow. Okay. 
Mm. I don't know. See, that's always a question when it comes to when you're talking about an executive. An executive who knows how to stay in their lane it, is in a lot of ways some preferable to right. somebody who you're ideologically aligned with, but who wants to rule with a pen. Yeah. I mean, th- that's why I don't hate a lot of like the judges that Trump has appointed. It's like, I, don't, I know that we may not agree on issues, but from an, like Kavanaugh, I think it's going to be pretty weak. It's pretty, yeah. Wish. But I think in terms of the administrative state, he's going to curb a lot of the executive's power. So from that perspective, I'm, I'm looking forward to them doing that. All right, we're in the home stretch here. All right, we're Jay Inslee. There. This guy just got in the race. Let's see, what are his credentials? He has been a politician for over three decades as a member of the House and governor in Washington State. He referred to himself as the climate change candidate, uh, but he has not actually released a plan yet, saying that it is his main focus for the presidency. Uh, He sued Trump for the travel ban, and he blatantly sponsored a bill to have taxpayers pay for five new buildings in the Washington State campus, which had several donors for his campaign. Instead of hiding or not addressing the issue, he lamented that he could not write a bill that added more. Uh, One of his House speakers, his House speaker said, uh, he is not afraid to incur the wrath of the speaker or the caucus. He also successfully lobbied to legalize gay marriage in Washington while governor. He promised to oppose tax increases, but failed miserably and has even signed many new ones. He became the uh, first state in the nation to institute a second estate tax. There were problems in Seattle that have largely tainted his statistics as governor. Minimum wage increases and increases in corporate tax rates saw the departure and reduction for companies like Alaska Airlines, Amazon, Boeing, Microsoft, and Kaiser Permanente. Of all governors in the U.S. over the last 20 years, none have provided over, presided over larger increases in unemployment and homelessness than Inslee. Eee. Now, I heard an interview with Inslee, and he is sort of doing what Dick Luger did in 96. Uh, Dick Luger was not running to be president necessarily. Dick Luger was running to raise a bunch of issues that he didn't feel got a lot of airtime. He's being a libertarian. Right. Like Luger ran to talk about nuclear proliferation and he wanted to talk about child like school lunches and things like that. He, he knew he was probably not going to win presidency, the presidency, but he was trying to, to raise awareness of issues. Ensley is doing that for climate change. And that is pretty much all he's going to talk about as a candidate. Um, and so take that for what it's worth. Uh, now, the, Paper candidates. The, the following, except Eric Sal- Swalwell. I mean, this guy is just so obnoxious. Like his Twitter, I think he's the guy who said that he would nuke gun owners or he would nuke somebody if they disagree with him. He's just a stain. And, and These so, are kind of like the vermin supremes of the yeah, Democratic yeah, yeah. Party. Right. Like, yeah. So they're all below 0.1%. Wayne Messam. Now, the spiritual leader is polling above the governor of Montana and uh, Washington, by the way, including this guy. Mayor of Miramar City, Wayne Messam is, uh, in Florida, owned a construction company prior to this. Most extreme position is gun control, frequently stating that anything, pro- anything, uh, any project he ever works on will be gun-free. He's a child of Jamaican immigrants, would like to reform immigration, but has not yet released a plan to say how. Uh, Eric Salwell. He is a member of the California House of Representatives. He's become a staple on cable news when an interview is needed to deliver criticism of Trump. The Hill calls him the Snapchat King of Congress. He recorded a vine of himself voting against a ban on the uh, 20 week and later abortions, um, technically illegal. He defended himself saying, we operate under rules that were created in the 18th century. And I think it's time that Congress started to act more like regular Americans do. I did think I did not see this as impairing the decorum. I think what to, this did was highlight to all for all to see the democratic process. It's kind of kind of his version of taking a ballot selfie. Right. He uh, focused on combating gun violence and limiting gun ownership. He co-founded the March for Our Lives, which is the gun violence protest in D.C. Right. The who was uh, who's the guy? The kid that everybody hates on Twitter. Oh, oh, David um, oh, yeah, Hogg. David. The shaved head girl and uh, from Stoneyman Douglas High School. Um, traveling Iowa, the first primary state with Cameron Kasky, a survivor from the Marjorie Stoneman Stone Douglas High School shooting. Uh, he supports an increase in, to the cap on Social Security tax, which would allow the rich to pay taxes in excess, uh, which would allow, I like the, the way that's phrased. Right. Um, 
to pay taxes in excess of $110,000 per year, but still cap their Social Security income after retirement to the prior amount. He advocates for repealing No Child Left Behind and possibly proposes a mandatory buyback of military-style semi-automatic assault weapons with prosecution for anyone who fails to comply after the allotted time. He is one of those guys who is running for president. So every time he goes on cable news, it says former presidential candidate. Uh huh. Uh, a lot of these guys are doing that for that reason, but him. Mm-hmm. Uh, John, John Hickenlooper, governor of Colorado from 2011 to 2019, mayor of Denver for eight years before that, owned a brewery and a bar before that. His popularity alone has taken Colorado from a swing state to one of the most consistently blue states in the nation during the red tide six years into obama's presidency colorado was the only state in the nation to gain democratic seats in either house or senate in 2008 his referendums which all passed on a ballot took the city income tax rate from 2.9 percent to 22 percent for perspective bridgeport connecticut has the highest tax today at 20 percent so um let's see here that's when he was mayor of Col- mayor of Denver. He raised from 2.9 to 22 percent. Uh, now, after sales tax and fees, residents would end up losing over one third of their checks to just Denver, not not counting in Colorado and the federal government. As governor, he then got referendum C and D to pass, which moved the tax burden onto the entire state of Colorado. Now Denver is down to an 8.3 percent tax income tax rate colorado's tax rate once the lowest in the nation before hickenlooper is at 4.31 percent right down the middle of the road Uh, stimulus done right colorado's debt per citizen has skyrocketed under hickenlooper Um, so he's raised a bunch of taxes but their debt per citizen has skyrocketed under him before his tenure their debt per citizen was among the lowest in the nation it is now the fourth highest behind only new york California and Illinois still citizens have approved because unlike those other States, the jobs and money spent have actually grown the size of city of Denver and the state, the jobs that never appeared in New York, Denver and Illinois, especially Chicago actually did show up to Denver. Why (laughs) this coincided with marijuana legalization, which also helped a great deal. And he favored the measure against the wishes of his own police chief. And I think I've had, we've lost, I think, four co-hosts to Colorado <laughs> since the beginning of, of this th- two, three years ago. I mean, how many, of my, how many of your friends, I've had at least half a dozen go visit Colorado. Uh, I've had, oh. half, you know, five move to Colorado. I mean, Colorado is growing by leaps and bounds because of marijuana legalization. Yeah, I mean, I'm looking for any opportunity to Head out that way. <laughs> All right. Richard Ojeda, who I think is actually an interesting person, um, but go ahead. State Senator from West Virginia. He's running on three issues, Medicare for all, marijuana legalization, anti-lobbying. While he has claimed to be a moderate, he embraces left-wing populism. He once said, back when I was in high school, being a Republican was like cursing, which I'm not quite sure what that's supposed to mean. <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, he served. You'd be ashamed to say that you're a Republican, just like you uh, say fuck in front of your family. Oh, so only in front of your family, though, in front of your friends, though. Totally cool. Right. Gotcha. Gotcha. He served 24 years in the U.S. Army. Um, he has stated, I don't think I'll ever vote for a Democrat for president and supported Donald Trump in 2016. He told Politico that he voted for Trump because he initially believed Trump would do something for West Virginians. And by 2018, he regretted that saying he hasn't done shit and he's taking care of daggone people he's supposed to be getting rid of. He supported Bernie Sanders in the Democratic primary. So, you know, it, I really feel like that's a perfect highlight of that. He's a populist. He's not, he doesn't necessarily pick one side. He will go with either Trump or Sanders. He's most famous for his role in Michael Moore's Fahrenheit 11.9, where he said, I'm sick and tired of people telling me America is the greatest country because we can whip your ass. And I don't give a shit who you are. I'll fight you in the damn street right now. Now, if you've never seen a picture of Richard Ojeda, he looks like Dick, Dick Butkus. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Do you know who Dick Butkus is? Yeah. The, all right. He's just like this big faced dude with a mustache and he looks, has a face of steel. He, he was one of those guys who was supposed to win in the blue wave and then lost early, fairly early on. So he couldn't even win his state, his congressional seats. So I don't think he's going to win for president, but he's sort of a cartoonish, funny guy. 
Um, but uh, sort of fiercely independent, and uh, let's just give him a chance. I mean, that's all I'm asking. Uh, if you, so if you insist. <laughs> so just to be thorough. Because uh, we I don't have enough candidates. Just to be thorough, where this is the end. All right, we're almost there. Still in exploratory committees. There's Michael Arth. He's an architect, an artist, and a political scientist out of Florida. Anybody who calls themselves a political scientist is a douchebag. Uh, ran as an independent for governor in the last election. Uh, Sarah, Harry Brown. Harry Braun is a renewable energy consultant and researcher. He's run for president twice, 2012 and 2016. He switches between independent and Democrat. Ken Wadik in Wadiki Jr. He is a, f- a documentary filmmaker. And Robbie Wells, a high school football coach. <laughs> I want to know more about him. I'm, I'm all in. Uh, there's also Mike Gravel. I, he wasn't on this list, but Mike Gravel, who ran for uh, the Libertarian Party nomination in 2008. Uh, I met him. I interviewed him actually for the radio station that I worked for at the time. I found him to be an interesting man. He was old as dirt in 2008. Can't imagine now, but he's savage on Twitter, which means some staffer is savage. Oh my goodness. Uh, Robert Wells is, Robbie Wells is a former constitution party member. (laughs) Oh, okay. All right. Well, that that means he's great. He uh, unsuccessfully sought their nomination in 2012. Uh, Ran as an independent in 2016. Sorry. I, High school football coach. I had to look it up. I, I'm totally with you. I saw that. <laughs> I almost said, can I take the very last one? Because it <laughs> makes me laugh. But Mike Gravel is also running. He's very anti-war. He's, uh, he sort of fits in that wing of the Democratic Party we talked about earlier, like the Intercept and Democracy Now. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and I think a lot of libertarians, like if you're going to support Tulsi Gabbard, then Mike Gravel might actually be the one that you're going to support over uh, Tulsi. Tulsi is, let's be honest, Sarah, Tulsi is pretty. And so I think that's why a lot of these uh, libertarian guys are uh, like, that's why they're supporting her. I, am I being unfair towards them for the third? Mm, not entirely, no. All right. Um, all right. I want to thank our patrons. Uh, first off, I should have done this so much earlier. And so I apologize to our patrons, but thank you to Ed Brehob, intern Ed. Thank you. Thank you for being at the $100 level. Jason Doolittle, uh, love you, Jason. Um, the Libertarian Coalition, go like their Facebook page, get involved in the Libertarian Coalition. Great guys over there. Brandon, uh, well, Brandon's, Brandon's not uh, been with us. I just read the name on accident. Craig DaCosta and the lovely Christy Avery. Uh, Craig DaCosta, who has given me lots of information on Tulsi Gabbard. Um, as he lives in Hawaii. So he, I said, what do you think of Tulsi? And he just was like, I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know why anybody's supporting her. So uh, thank you to those patrons. We really do appreciate your support. So Sarah, to sum it all up, I mean, if you had to sum all this up, what, what are your feelings on this field? I mean, the people that we like aren't going to win anyways. I mean, did you like any of them? No, but I mean, the people who we hate less or i mean i don't hate anybody but they're all kind of disappointing um you'd like to see not kamala harris that's what i'd like to see please don't pick kamala harris i think she's the one i want the least i think i'm with you i think she uh criminal justice reform for a long time has always been kind of my my bugaboo i mean really for the last decade i would say and i think she's the scariest in terms of the police state i think she's just Mm -hmm. atrocious i think there's a decent chance of of warren doing well but i think that if they if they end up nominating warren they're going to run into a lot of the same problems they ran into with clinton um not necessarily she doesn't have all the baggage that clinton has with her but she's not warm uh and and she's easy to make fun of and trump is gonna love that yeah Oh, he'll joke right in, right back into a second term. I think Bernie Sanders is the scariest economically. And I think in terms of incompetence, I think people really don't understand how incompetent this guy is. I think he just, like as president, like if we think Donald Trump is incompetent, like, at, like say what you want about Donald Trump. He still has like a business empire and has some business smarts and management smarts. Like he, he, like, Bernie Sanders is 
a quarter of his experience, like if that. So I, I think Bernie Sanders would probably be the most disastrous um, out of this, out of that first tier, first and second tier. Like I think, you know, Beto probably wouldn't really know what he was doing, but he wouldn't do as bad of a job as Bernie, you know? So I, I really kind of look at it. I got a note from Christy Avery. She's been trolling, sitting in and listening and trolling the conversation. Um, she goes, this is the best they have. And that's when we were on candidate five. <laughs> so yeah. I just really look at this field and I just go, what a weak field. What a missed opportunity. This is John Kerry. They nominate Biden. It's John Kerry all over again. You know, Bush. But was, is it better than the Bush. libertarian field? No, no. I, I got another. Exactly. Sarah, I got another email from the daughter of one of the candidates saying, my dad pretends to be a good family man. Here's all the ways that he abused me. And I'm not going to say that candidate's name, but this is one of the ones that we knew didn't like it was, he was not on that list. Like that makes like five that have very problematic issues. And, uh, you know, I just did the last episode on the swamp about a mosh. It's like, I'm praying for a mosh to run. So I have somebody to vote for, but at this point I'm definitely not voting for Trump. I'm yeah. not voting for any of these people. Like it, and I'm not going to vote for any of the libertarians. Like, I, I mean, Sarah, gun to your head. Out of out of all these people, would you would you vote for any of the libertarians that you've heard on our debate series, or would you roll the dice and vote for one of the two major party candidates? Oh, I might vote for Weld in a primary. <laughs> <laughs> right like but even then i'm like oh that's how bad it is that's how bad it is bill weld is the best option yes <laughs> yeah yeah no seriously though but out of out of our current contenders and i mean there's there's a lot of great libertarian candidates but the problem with them is they don't they're only known within libertarian circles and that's i think that's problematic enough you, like think, what yeah go ahead you just just what is it what is your you know what are you coming out with showing me that you are going to be any good at this job when you've never held elected offices. I mean, like that's the biggest thing is we don't have anybody who has any experience who's even running for office anymore. Well, I mean, that was my biggest problem with Gary Johnson and Bill Weld, two former governors, you know, they're on 60 minutes saying, uh, well, who would be in your cabinet? Ah, gee, I don't know. You know, and, uh, and I look so at the, you have no intention of winning, right? Exactly. You have no intention of winning. And, and the current crop of candidates are running to be the king of the libertarian echo chamber. Mm -hmm. I, just, I don't have any time for that. Like, I think Kim Ruff is the least objectionable of all these people. I think she is a very nice person who is. But very what has she done? Right. And, and at the end of the day, it's like, is she going to excite any, anyone to vote for her? And I'm not going to, I'm not going to recommend that any of my friends or family vote for somebody that has, allegations of child molestation or domestic violence and so it's like i hope kim ruff can put together a, a list of cabinet members and policies that she, like so she can look like a real candidate if if this is what we're gonna what we're gonna go with i mean yeah give me a reason to be able to vote for it right like the libertarian party presidential candidate is the only time in a four year period where your friends and family actually give a shit about anything you're talking about when it comes to libertarian. Yep. And they're the main representative for the ideology in the minds of most people. Mm -hmm. And so don't let yourself get fooled that all the people, all the libertarians that you see on social media every day that you talk to every day are like that. There's a lot out of uh, out there. Like you're looking at 2000 people and this is a country of 360 million people. Mm -hmm. And so 360 million people, let's be realistic, 150 million people are going to look or at least have a question about the libertarian candidate and you're going to put up Arvin, you know, like who is intentionally inflaming people. Yeah. It's, it's such a bad strategy. So I, I'm thoroughly unimpressed with them and uh, I'm thoroughly unimpressed with all, all of these Democrats. Like I, I, you know, if I had to pick one of these Democrats, like, all right, Let's go with uh, let's go with Tulsi, who mm. is going to lead with non-interventionism and make that case. Let's go yeah. with an issue-oriented candidate who's going to actually talk about something that I care about. But I, I just look at this list and I go, Trump's probably going to get reelected because there's not a good third-party challenger. There's 
not uh, – I didn't see Bloomberg on this list. I don't know if he's dropped out. I know he was thinking about running. Um, and then also, I don't know if Howard Schultz, the Starbucks CEO, is still going to run independent. Like, I don't know. I'm, I'm really at this point – I know we're a year and a half out. Bloomberg's not running. Okay. All right. I don't think I'm voting for president at this point. That's really sad. Yeah. I mean, I can't, I can't disagree. I'm, so yeah, like my position is I'm stuck at, I, I can maybe vote for Weld in the primary, but that's not a great position to be at. I don't even think I can do that. <laughs> like, I just don't, I don't know. I may go full Roger Paxton and say voting is violence. Oh, uh, it's my don't become one of those people. Don't become one of those people. I get closer every day, Sarah. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> it's just a cop out. It's just a cop out. I don't know. You I know what? This is why we always appreciate that libertarians give you none of the above as an option. Hell yeah. All right. Well, thank you for joining me, Sarah. Uh, I- any final thoughts? Any self- shameless self-promotion that you'd like to do? The, the floor is yours. Oh, I actually don't have any same shameless self-promotion for myself right now. I've been terrible at keeping up with doing media stuff. Uh, check me out here. All right. Uh, you have um, you just actually today and yesterday. Uh, were uh, yeah, I did. I did dailies. You had two dailies that got released: the the war on terror, and then um, what was the other one? Uh, it was the um, oh, universal charitable tax credits. Right. So these dailies we have scheduled out like two weeks from now, and if you're a Patreon member, you got you have all of them. I I don't know if the patrons hate me or love us. Because there's like, I dropped like 20 hours in the last week of new content. Uh, so everybody hey, will be kept up. Everybody's been doing a great job, very relevant material, good stuff. So uh, shout out to, to you, to Hody, uh, to uh, the Boss Hog Boys, to Brian Nichols, who's going to have an interview with Justin Amash and to everybody that participated in all the dailies. I really do appreciate it. And well, if they've made it this far, I'm going to make an appeal to, you know, I've been traveling around and getting to know a lot of wonderful, fun, you know, liberty activists and building new coalitions. If there's anything that you're passionate about and that you would love to do a daily on, feel free to reach out to me on social media and we can set up a time of them in your area and you can come and be on We Are Libertarians yourself. That'd be great. All right. That's it, Sarah. Thank you for joining me and I appreciate it. All right. Bye. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> I'm terrible go. with sign offs. I always just, have been. I'm going to leave that in there. <laughs> I'm terrible. You know what? I am so bad at it, too. Like, it was so easy when Greg was here because a lot of things were easy when Greg was here. <laughs> uh, you know, and we'll do better next time. And it was just so, it, uh, it was a sign off. I have no sign off now because it's just me. I mean, even when Harry's here, it's just me doing the whole show by myself. You just so. got to be comfortable just cutting it off. No, I'm, I'm not good at that. You know that. <laughs> two and a half hours it's so it's true it's true uh-huh. i don't know i think we came in right at two hours of actual recorded time yeah yeah once we actually uh trim off that beginning it's it's about i think we almost got to under two hours with all the democrats but it took it a lot hours to give you basic information there's too many democrats so all right everybody thanks for joining us and then we will see you tomorrow here in this feed on we are libertarians that may be a good one i might do that from now on there you go Thank you, Sarah. I appreciate it. That was good. No problem. Yeah, that's fun. Yeah, you definitely sometimes need veering back from tangents. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> tangents are what make us... Tangents it are It is. What- it is. Yeah, I'm sorry. I was even thinking about it. I was like, I'm used to doing this with people when you're interviewing them. You're like, hey, hey. Right. But back to what we were talking about. No, because if you veer off too much, then people go, what the fuck? But if you don't mm-hmm. veer off ever, then people kind of go, they're not... They're just going to listen to the information they want. They Like... They stay tuned to hear what you're going to say on, on some of these tangents, but sometimes I'm not relevant, so <laughs> it is what it is. <laughs> All, All right. right. Thank you, Sarah. Have a nice evening. You too. Bye. Bye. Bye, Christy.